everyone. The Subcommittee on Consumer Protection and Financial Institutions will come to order. Uh, without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess of the subcommittee at any time. And without objection, members of the full committee not on this subcommittee are authorized to participate in today's hearing. As a reminder, I ask all members to keep themselves muted when they are not being recognized to minimize disturbances while members are asking questions of our witnesses. Uh, the staff have been instructed not to mute members except where a member is not being recognized and there is inadvertent background noise. Members are reminded that all house rules relating to order and decorum apply to this remote hearing. Members are also reminded that they may participate in only one remote proceeding at a time, Mr. Luke DeMeyer. If you are participating today, please keep your camera on. And if you choose to attend a different remote proceeding, please turn your camera off. If members wish to be recognized during the hearing, please identify yourself by name to facilitate recognition. Uh, we're in a very busy time, but we have a subject uh, that I think is particularly important and really goes to the heart of our subcommittee's business. Today's title of our hearing is Banking Innovation or Regulation Evasion, Exploring Modern Trends in Financial Institution Charters. I now recognize myself for four minutes to give an opening statement. In 1863, President Lincoln signed the National Currency Act into law, taking the first step in establishing the national banking system. One of the primary goals of the National Currency Act and the subsequent National Bank Act was the standardization of currency to protect consumers against uncertainty in the valuation of banknotes, rampant counterfeiting, and fraud. In his 1864 address to Congress, President Lincoln said that the government and the people will derive great benefit from this change in the banking systems of the country can hardly be questioned. The national system will create a reliable and permanent influence in support of the national credit and protect people against losses in the use of paper money. At the heart of our banking system is a promise of consumer protection and benefit to the people. President Lincoln knew our national banking system needed to be reliable, stable, honest, consistent across all states and effective. Over the last 150 years, the banking system has changed a great deal, but its core mission to serve the people by taking deposits, offering credit and facilitating transactions and intermediating transactions remains principally the same. In recent years, a variety of non-bank and FinTech companies have sought to engage in the business of banking or in activities very similar to banking. Few of these companies have sought traditional banking charters either because they are wary of the additional regulation and supervision that comes with being a bank or because the structure of their business does not fit squarely within a traditional charter. Many of the unconventional charters do not come with the same level of regulation and supervision traditional charters require. Despite the innovations of the last 10 years, many of the questions we will be discussing today are not new. Industrial loan companies have been around since 1910, and the debate over the separation of banking and commerce predates even the National Currency Act. In recent years, the Office of the Comptroller of Currency has granted fintech companies banking charters, but the debate about what, constitute the, what constitutes the business of banking and what makes banks special is a much older conversation. We do not want to slow innovation, but it is the Congress's duty to ensure change comes at the benefit and not the detriment of the people. As the economy continues to reopen from the pandemic, it is important our financial system remains stable and strong and consumers are treated fairly and honestly. Most banks and credit unions have been a source of strength in the pandemic in part because of the stringent capital liquidity and other regulatory requirements we place on these financial institutions. I look forward to the discussion. I want to compliment the panel on their very thorough uh, written testimony, and I'll be interested to see how all of you can stick within five minutes uh, based on your written materials. But this is, we're going to be dealing with financial stability, risks, consumer protection issues, 
market fairness questions, and the potential benefits of non-traditional banking charters. Additionally, I would like to ask both the committee members and the witnesses today to consider how we can encourage innovation alongside strong consumer protections, diversity, and inclusion in our banking system. With that, I'll yield back, and I'd like to now recognize Mr. Luptemeyer for four minutes for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for having us hearing on this important topic, and thank you to our witnesses today. I look forward to your testimony. <clears throat> as many of you know, before coming to Congress, I was at a banking business, both as a banker and as a regulator, for many, many years. While I may surprise some of you know I was not around during the Great Depression, I have seen a lot of changes within the banking industry during my 40 years as a regulator and banker. And Mr. Chairman, you don't need to be laughing at that. You're not much younger than I am. Um, I remember the savings and the low crisis of the 80s. I remember when people thought the innovation of credit and debit cards was it completely would completely eliminate checks. I also remember that when the Community Invest Reinvestment Act was signed into law, like everyone at this hearing, I remember the crash of 08. Throughout the years, banking has been fluid. It has changed with the times, adapted to become more capitalized, adapted to serve the communities in which they operate and serve more Americans. <clears throat> We're having this hearing today because the banking system is changing once again. In the last decade, we have seen a rise in financial technology or fintech companies that have truly pushed the innovation of, banking, of the banking industry from mobile payments to algorithmic lending and much more. As these entities have grown significantly in the last decade and become more permanent in our banking system, they have begun to seek out charting options that are consistent with the growth of their companies. The OCC has been extremely active in this space and sought to provide a chartering option for fintechs through a special purpose national bank charter for fintechs. However, that decision has been tied up in the courts in recent years. The OCC has also discussed the idea of a national charter for payment companies and separately has approved Anchorage for a national trust charter, making it the first digital asset bank. We should examine the pros and cons of the OCC's actions, but we should also examine the role of state banking regulators in regulation and charting of fintechs. Is the current state regulatory regime, is it the current state regulatory regime adequate? And is it necessary for the federal government to get involved? Another pathway explored by numerous entities to enter the banking system is the industrial loan company, ILC Charter. While ILCs are regulated on a federal level by the FDIC and supervised by state regulators, <clears throat> the parent company is not considered a bank holding company under the Bank Holding Company Act. This is a critical difference between bank holding companies that are supervised by the Federal Reserve and are restricted by law to activities closely related to banking. The separation of banking and commerce has been a key staple of our dual banking system and the rise of the ILC approvals and applications does, does raise questions of banking and commerce separation, safety and soundness, and privacy. Questions which I look forward to asking today. However, before Congress acts rashly to eliminate any charting options, it is critical to look at the entire ecosystem of chartering in the banking industry. For example, since 2010, there have been only 43 de novo banks. In that same period of time, the number of FDIC insurance depositories has decreased by roughly 2,000 institutions. That's almost four banks per week. In addition, the innovation of fintech companies has largely increased access to credit and lowered the number of unbanked and underbanked people in, in, our, in our society. The number of bank fintech partnership, the, the current, excuse me, the current bank, uh, bank fintech partnership model has proven extremely successful, not only in providing more services and access to businesses and consumers, but also has significant consumer protections and oversight through the regulation and supervision of banks. Congress should examine all these issues when taking action affecting the charter of institutions. I've always said that if you want to be a bank, you need to be regulated like a bank. If you believe this can be accomplished while providing a regulatory and chartering framework that allows fintech companies to continue to thrive in the banking industry while protecting the status of banks as a bedrock of our financial system, so be it. I look forward to raising these questions in our, in our witnesses uh, of our witnesses today. Uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you so much for the hearing. Thank the gentleman. Uh, the chair now recognizes the chairwoman of the full committee, the gentlewoman from California for the balance of our five minutes, which I think is about a minute and 23 seconds. Thank you very much, Chairman Perlmutter, for holding this very important hearing. 
The pandemic has accelerated the way people use technology to bank, obtain a loan, and make payments. At the same time, state regulators, community banks, credit unions, and consumer advocates have raised alarm about how new entities, including big tech firms, are receiving unconventional charters and offering bank products and services while evading regulations most banks, including community banks, comply with. Additionally, the OCC has overstepped its authority, pretending that laws signed by Abraham Lincoln were intended to create charters for fintech or cryptocurrency. I look forward to hearing from our panel on how Congress can promote responsible innovation that does not lead to a regulatory race to the bottom where consumers get hurt and the safety and soundness of our financial system is once again in peril. I yield back the balance of my time and thank you very much. Thank you, gentlelady yields back. Now I'd like to recognize the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. McHenry from North Carolina for the balance of his five minutes. Well, thank you, uh, thank you Mr. Chairman. And uh, Mr. Brooks, I, I wanna personally thank you for your leadership at the OCC and for testifying today. I wish you best in your future endeavors. Um, it's clear that my colleagues on the other side of the aisle wanna relive old debates here in the committee. And this is certainly an old debate. Uh, in framing uh, this discussion, I'll, I'll have to go back to my talking points, my notes from 2005, 2006, and 2007. You know, uh, I've used this quote before, but to quote Talleyrand in speaking about the Bourbon dynasty, they have learned nothing and forgotten nothing. It's all the same here. Uh, Yet consumers and businesses have preferences and continue to evolve. The private sector is innovating in uh, new ways to meet uh, the needs of our, all of our consumers. And we should be encouraging our regulators to seek regulatory requirements that fit these advancements, not hinder them. Republicans support uh, promoting an up-to-date regulatory framework that sets clear rules of the road for all participants. We want and will continue to work for the most inclusive financial system possible. And I yield back. Gentleman yields back, and that's the first time I've heard about Talleyrand in uh, 11 or 12 years. So thank you very much, uh, Mr. McHenry. Um, I'm now pleased uh, to welcome each of our witnesses and want to introduce the panel. And uh, I will let you all know that there are three Coloradans on this panel, uh, which makes it a particularly outstanding uh, group uh, to testify before the committee. Uh, first, we have Raul Carrillo, who is the Deputy Director of the LPE Project and Associate Research Scholar at Yale Law School. Mr. Carrillo's work focuses on the legal foundations of money, banking, and finance as a legal technology and mode of governance. Prior to joining the LPE Project, Mr. Carrillo was Policy Counsel at the Demand Progress Education Fund and a Fellow at the Americans for Financial Reform Education Fund. Second, we have Ms. Uh, Professor Eric Gerding, who is a law professor and a Wolf Scholar at the University of Colorado Law School. Professor Gerding's research interests include banking law, the regulation of financial products and institutions, payment systems, and corporate governance. And he has written extensively on the interaction between asset price bubbles and financial regulation. Professor Gerding previously taught at the University of New Mexico School of Law, and he has practiced law in New York and Washington. Our third panelist is Kristen Johnson, who is the Asia Briggs Candler Professor of Law at Emory University School of Law. Ms. Johnson's recent work includes a focus on emerging technologies such as distributed digital ledger technologies and enable the creation of digital assets and intermediaries. Prior to her work at Emory University School of Law, Ms. Johnson served as the McGlinchey Stafford Professor of Law and Associate Dean for the Faculty Research at Tulane University Law School. Our fourth panelist is Carlos Pacheco, who is the CEO of Premier Members Credit Union in Colorado, testifying on behalf of the National Association of Federally Insured Credit Unions, NAFCU. Mr. Pacheco has been CEO of Premier Members Credit Union since 2011, and he also serves as the board director for the Denver Boulder Better Business Bureau 
and the cabinet campaign chair for the Foothills United Way. Finally, we have former comptroller of the currency, uh, Brian Brooks, uh, a native Coloradan from Pueblo, Colorado. Mr. Brooks acting as acting comptroller from May 29, 2020 to January 14, 2021, after serving as senior deputy comptroller and chief operating officer at the OCC, where he oversaw bank supervision, systemic risk identification support, innovation, and other issues. Prior to his work at the OCC, Mr. Brooks served as chief legal officer of Coinbase Global, a cryptocurrency exchange. Witnesses are reminded your oral test of, and I should say to the two panelists, not from Colorado, uh, we'd be happy if you, uh, and honored if you chose to come to Colorado. Witnesses are reminded your oral testimony will be limited to five minutes. You should be able to see a timer on your screen that will indicate how much time you have left and a chime will go off at the end of your time. I would ask you to be mindful of the timer and quickly wrap up your testimony. If you hear the chime so we can be respectful of both witnesses and the committee's committee members time without objection, your written statements will be made part of the record. Once the witnesses finish their testimony, each member will have five minutes to ask questions. So we'll begin with Mr. Carrillo, you are now recognized for five minutes to give an oral presentation of your testimony. Thank you, Chair Palmrather, for the invitation. Thank you to Chair Waters, to Ranking Member Lukenmeyer, to Ranking Member McCarthy, and all members of the subcommittee. I offer my testimony as an Associate Research Scholar at Yale Law School, but most of my principles here were uh, created or developed um, by me as an attorney fighting and building on behalf of low income and no income clients in New York City, along with a group called New Economy Project. I echo my remarks to the Financial Technology Task Force last September and humbly requesting that uh, everyone consider the deeper impacts of fintech on democracy. There is now a need for serious stewardship. The pandemic response and the actions by regulators have cast into relief the fundamental ways in which governments shape money and markets. There is no taking politics out of tech because there is no taking the law out of tech or vice versa. Like physical tools, humans create and use legal tools with certain ideas for their use in mind. This morning, I have the luxury of presenting alongside Professor Johnson, Professor Gerding, and I will thus defer to them on many issues or otherwise point to my written testimony. I would like to focus on one underemphasized dimension um, of FinTech here today, and that's privacy and security. I hope to stress that the mass perpetual preemptive and predictive surveillance that is perpetuated by both the government and private technology companies, often in partnership, very much including fintech companies, should be of deep concern for everyone, regardless of party affiliation. Civil rights and civil liberties, including our fundamental freedoms under the Fourth Amendment, the First Amendment, and the general law of warrants that Parliament and the commoners won against the tyranny of King George. Certain invasive product products and partnerships should not be allowed in our system, regardless of whether they are considered to be arbitrage or not by regulators. Treating innovation as an unqualified good does not lead us to equitable, sustainable, cooperative innovation that allows us to truly prosper together. As Vanderbilt Law Professor Morgan Ricks has stressed, and President Lincoln might agree, money is infrastructure. As scholars like Christine Dazon and Lev Manan stress, money is also part of our constitutional order, and regulation flows from Congress's authority over the public purse. On the corporate side, surveillance has now become the business model of fintech and many other companies. Congress should shift the burden of privacy protection away from consumers by establishing a short list of permissible purposes for data collection and banning all others. This is envisioned by Senator Brown's Data Act of 2020. This is especially important because the government currently deputizes financial institutions as anti-money laundering cops on the beat. In 1992, Congress required the filing of suspicious activity reports, SARS, relevant to any possible violation of the law. This is incentivized and burdened firms who must act as cops on the beat and send data often automatically to government fusion centers. At these fusion centers, which serve as data platforms for local and federal law enforcement, Peter Thiel's Palantir aggregates information and shares it more widely with law enforcement around the world. Unfortunately, there is a hole in Fourth Amendment doctrine. The court has claimed that we cannot have an expectation of privacy in anything shared with the business. 
This means, as the crypto community will tell you, that there is no privacy in finance. Our infrastructure has no place for privacy within it. This impinges not only on our Fourth Amendment rights, but on our First Amendment values of freedom of association and freedom of speech, especially for certain vulnerable communities. In this context, it is deeply troubling to me that FinTech promotes financial inclusion via increasingly invasive biometric data. Moreover, an app or bank account is not the answer to every problem. As Berkeley Law Professor Abby Atkinson has recently stressed in concert with community advocates, credit is not a structural cure for poverty. It has downsides. People need better wages and better benefits. Just as importantly, we should not con consign everyday folks, including necessarily ourselves, to unnecessary and dangerous invasion of their privacy, our privacy, in order to participate in the payment system. We deserve to be one in the crowd. SARS have not made us safer. True money laundering often occurs without notice. The most notorious example, excuse me, the most notorious example is HSBC's actions in laundering money for the Sinaloa cartel in Mexico. Between 2010 and 2012, 18 financial institutions have received deferred prosecution agreements. At least four of them have broken the same AML law again and simply received another fine. BuzzFeed News and the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists recently released thousands of FinCEN files showing that the system does not work by its own logic and again does not make us safer. I see the evolution of digital cash as a middle ground between privacy technology like crypto and folks who want the banking system to spy on all of us. I join Ricks, Menand, John Crawford, Marissa Baradaran, Bob Hockett, Talia Morova, and many others in advocating for public bank accounts at the federal level. And I also join the activists who's fighting for this on the state and local level. Just as importantly, though, we need cash wallets that replicate the true privacy um, that a closed container for our cash is created. The lead technologist on this and the best work is coming from Rowan Gray, who is privacy lead at the International Telecommunications Mr. Union. Mr. Carrillo. This is very important for future security. Thank you. All right. Gentlemen's time has expired. Thank you, sir. Uh, Professor Gerding, you are now recognized for five minutes to give an oral presentation of your testimony. Thank you, Chairman Perlmutter. Uh, thank you, Ranking Member Member Luthemeyer, uh, Chair Waters, and Ranking Member McHenry, uh, and members of the committee for inviting me to testify today. Uh, my name is Eric Gerding. I'm a law professor at the University of Colorado, where my research focuses on banking and securities laws. I will focus my testimony today on three things. First, the FDIC's decision to reopen applications for deposit insurance for industrial loan companies. Second, the OCC's radical new FinTech charter. And third, and more broadly, why banking law separates banking from commerce and commercial firms from banking. That last issue came to a head in 2005 when Walmart applied to the FDIC for deposit insurance for a new ILC that Walmart was seeking to charter. Walmart's application set off a political and legal fire. This firestorm is now threatening to re-erupt now that the FDIC and OCC are reopening Pandora's box through charters that would confer the powers and privileges of banks on non-banks. It's important that this committee look not just at initial applicants for charters, because it is hard to see how the FDIC or OCC would come up with legally defensible distinctions that would keep out bigger companies, Amazon, Apple, Google, Walmart, from one or both of these non-bank bank charters. But why do we separate banking from commerce? What is the harm in endowing banks with the powers and privileges of banking? The concerns are not just progressive, but also deeply conservative concerns. We should worry about commercial firms using bank charters to undercut rivals without charters. We should worry about conglomerates in retail and tech using the powers and privileges of banks to entrench market dominant positions. We should worry about small retail, small retailers and small startup tech firms not being able to compete with well-resourced and politically connected firms 
that have the powers of a government charter behind them. We should worry equally about banking conglomerates competing unfairly in non-bank markets. We should also worry about whether small banks and credit unions can face distorted competition. Most troubling, we should worry about a banking system that could quickly devolve into being dominated by the three bids, big Wall Street, big tech, and big retail. We should, in short, worry about the core reasons that we separate commerce and banking to prevent concentrations of economic and political power, to prevent distortions in commercial markets that allow unfair government subsidized competition, and to prevent distortions in banking markets that could leave banking markets destabilized and without the smallest community banks and credit unions. Non-bank charters could thus undermine one of the core missions they are purported to serve, offering greater access to financial services for underserved communities. There are better ways to serve that goal. I turn quickly to the FDIC charter, because one thing I want to, the committee uh, to understand is that it's important that ILCs are not subject to consolidated super supervision by the Federal Reserve. Consolidated supervision is the cornerstone that allows bank regulators to ensure that large financial conglomerates or large commercial conglomerates are not playing games with subsidies uh, that come with deposit insurance or the other powers and privileges of banking. Consolidated supervision is a world away from the ordinary supervision that the FDIC and OCC apply to individual uh, firms and institutions. That critical distinction is something that the committee must uh, remember. I would urge the committee to reverse the power grab by the OCC uh, and foreclose and preclude the OCC from issuing any new charters to institutions that do not accept deposits. I would also urge the committee to close the ILC loophole and pursue other options for, for greater access to banking by underserved communities. Uh, thank you, Professor, and the chime didn't go off, so we uh, hit it right on five minutes and obviously uh, the testimony of all our panelists, they're dealing with the purpose of the banking system, the history of the banking system, and the future of the banking system. So this is a, a very comprehensive and complex uh, subject that we all have, and I would uh, recommend to the committee that they really look uh, deeply into the materials that have been provided. Uh, Professor Johnson, you are now recognized for five minutes to give your oral presentation uh, of your testimony. Thank you so much. Good morning, Chair Waters, Chair Perlmutter, Ranking Member Luthmeyer, and the members of the committee and subcommittee. Um, thank you for inviting me to this hearing, uh, examining banking innovation and regulatory evasion, trends in financial institution charters. As the chair uh, mentioned, I am the Asa Griggs Candler Professor of Law at Emory University Law School, where I teach courses on corporations, securities law, emerging technologies, and financial markets including the mouthful distributed digital ledger technologies, which we commonly describe as blockchain technologies, as well as the assemblage of technologies commonly described as artificial intelligence. Um, I, am, I previously served as the McGlinchey Stafford Professor of Law and Associate Dean of Faculty Research at Tulane. That was also noted, but I also served as Director of the Program on Financial Market Stability in the Center for Law and the Economy. And if I may, uh, I'm a reformed capital markets uh, and mergers acquisitions lawyer and served as in-house counsel and an analyst at two of the largest uh, investment banks in global financial markets. My research promotes transparent, inclusive, responsible innovation and intimates and focuses on the core values that intimate financial markets regulation, promoting consumer protection, maintaining fair and orderly markets and ensuring the safety and soundness of financial markets. Over the last decade, a growing number of digital startups have launched bids to lure business away from the financial services industry. Increasingly large technology platforms engage, uh, essentially engage, engaged in essentially commercial activities as well as social media platforms, right? Seek opportunities to conduct 
bank-like activities. Um, Amazon, Google, Facebook, among others, have launched a dizzying array of consumer credit and financial services. To echo Mr. Carrillo and also uh, my colleague, Professor Gerding, um, these firms comprise a small subset of a burgeoning spectrum of businesses integrating complex technologies and financial services. Armed with vast quantities of data and sophisticated algorithmic that would be supervised and unsupervised machine learning platforms. These are algorithms, right? Inspired um, also by the creation and potential of blockchain based technologies, these fintech firms have revived long standing debates regarding the architectural design, regulatory framework, and role of the financial services industry. This important hearing explores the nature of relationships among banking and non-banking financial institutions, as well as the promise and peril uh, or perils of extending special purpose non-bank charters to non-depository fintech firms that do not engage in certain activities quintessentially understood as core banking functions, as well as commercial firms seeking to obtain licenses to operate as industrial banks. As this committee discussed previously in a hearing in the fall where colleagues uh, Raul Castillo, Mr. Raul Castillo here, and Professor Art uh, Wilmart testified, um, the National Bank Act clearly limits the scope of the OCC's authority to issue FinTech charters to deposit non-depository institutions. To quote others who have written extensively and researched the history of banking regulation, um, and the canons of statutory interpretation, non-depository national bank is an oxymoron. I'm happy to say more, citing the National Bank Act, in particular uh, Section 24 of the 7th, the OCC's authority to extend charters, but I believe much of that is covered in the, in the written testimony provided by witnesses today. Coupled with the movement by the OCC to expand um, charters, the industrial loan companies uh, chartering question has emerged as, this, as an essential uh, issue uh, in today's hearing, as well as um, conversations and debates. Finally, this hearing, as the chair has noted, covers a scope of uh, financial technology firms and captures states that are issuing or distributing licenses for blockchain-based um, financial institutions or institutions custodying uh, financial assets uh, known as crypto assets um, also, so bank licenses to the, those entities as well. In my remaining time, I want to point out just the following um, issue that is tremendously of concern. These, these entities are operating with the promise of inclusion, but this promise is often inaccurate, misleading, and in some instances, a misrepresentation. Where the promise of disclusion inclusion um, attaches to vulnerable unbanked and underbanked populations, consumers who are, in many instances, families in fragile financial circumstances, it is critical for us to carefully examine um, the truths behind the promises that have been made and install guardrails that would ensure any entity operating in the banking space is subject to sufficient regulatory uh, oversight. For families with fragile financial circumstances, as Raul pointed out or Mr. Carrillo pointed out, Credit may serve as a lifeline, enabling consumers to meet short-term debt obligations and to pay for education, transportation, housing, medicine, childcare, and even food. Without access to credit on fair and reasonable terms, it can be extraordinarily expensive to be poor. I'd also point out the surveillance questions and highlight that COVID-19 has amplified these concerns. Um, in the remaining time, I just encourage the committee uh, to support the limitation on banking charters and ILC licenses. Thank you, Professor. Uh, now we will have uh, uh, Mr. Pacheco speak. You are now recognized for five minutes to give uh, your oral presentation of your testimony. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Perlmutter, Ranking Member Luca Meyer, and members of the subcommittee. My name is Carlos Pacheco. I am the CEO of Premier Members Credit Union, headquartered in Boulder, Colorado. I'm pleased to be joining you today on behalf of NAFQ to share our views on the trends in financial institution charters. The nation's approximately 5,000 federally insured credit unions serve a different purpose and have a fundamentally different structure than other types of financial institutions, as not-for-profits existing solely to provide financial services to our members. We are pleased to be on the front lines working with our members to help them survive the economic uncertainty from the pandemic. The growth of financial technology in recent years offers new opportunities for the delivery of financial services. The use of FinTech can have a positive effect on the credit union membership. Many credit unions embrace innovations in technology in order to improve member relationships, and NAFQ believes that this is important for regulators like the NCUA to ensure that credit unions have the proper authority in this space under their charters. However, the growth of FinTech also presents threats and challenges as new entities emerge in an environment that can be under-regulated or under-supervised. As such, when FinTechs compete with regulated financial institutions, they must do so on a level playing field. 
While many fintechs are still subject to various consumer protection and other laws, they are not examined nor face the same oversight as other players in the financial services marketplace, creating cracks in the system that could pose risks to both the consumer and the financial system. For example, under-regulation of fintech companies can place a greater burden on credit unions' efforts to protect deposit accounts. As the primary financial institution for our members, we are often the preferred party for resolving issues involving unauthorized transactions, even when they occur on other platforms. While credit union consumer complaint processes are overseen by regulators, there is no comparable oversight for fintech companies that facilitate payment transactions, even in instances where they share responsibility for resolving errors under Reg E. A minimally staffed call center may be all it takes to steer financial fintech users to the credit union if there's a problem, and that alone can create competitive imbalance. There's been a recent trend in which fintech companies are enjoying liberalization of banking charter rules to either acquire or become banks. Recent developments with both the OCC's new chartering options and the FDIC's chartering and approval of deposit insurance for a new wave of industrial loan companies also present problems. In each case, a non-bank company can potentially evade regulation under the Bank Holding Company Act, either because of a statutory loophole unique to ILCs or because the entity is seeking a limited purpose charter and will not accept deposits. Lack of BHCA coverage raises concerns regarding the quality and extent of supervision for these specialized banking entities. In certain cases, specialized limited purpose bank charters may allow a fintech to operate with national banking privileges but without the same prudential safeguards that apply to traditional banks and credit unions. While some may characterize these chartering initiatives as innovative, they invite the potential for under-regulation of novel risks and could create an uneven playing field. Depending on the scale or risk of activities, which might involve facilitating cryptocurrency transactions, lack of consolidated supervision by the Federal Reserve could create additional financial stability risks. To address these concerns, NAFQ supports steps such as imposing a moratorium on new ILC charter approvals by the FDIC and closing the Bank Holding Company Act loophole for existing ILCs. It is also important that existing charters, such as those for credit unions, are kept up to date to meet member needs. Congress should also ensure that the data security and privacy requirements for financial institutions in the Graham-Leach-Bliley Act, including supervision for compliance, apply to all who are handling consumer financial transactions. Regulators also have an important role to play. For example, the CFPB should use its larger participants authority to regulate and supervise technology firms and fintech companies that enter into the financial services marketplace. New chartering ideas should also be subject to the notice and comment rulemaking process. Congress should also consider creating an FFIEC subcommittee on emerging technology to monitor the risks posed by, finance, by fintech companies and develop a joint approach for facilitating innovation and identifying regulatory gaps between new and existing charter options. In conclusions, credit unions look forward to continuing to experience growth in the technology space as a way for us to better serve our members. However, as technology companies expand and new charters emerge to compete in the financial services marketplace, it's important that they compete on a level playing field of regulation and supervision. Finally, it is important that Congress ensures laws are modernized to allow credit unions to keep up and compete with technological advances. I thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today, and I welcome any questions you may have. Thank you, uh, Mr. Pacheco. I, is it snowing in Colorado? I should ask you that. But, uh, not this hour, but maybe next hour. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Um, Mr. Brooks, uh, you are now recognized for five minutes uh, for your oral testimony. Well, uh, Chairwoman Waters, Ranking Member McHenry, uh, my fellow Colorado Chairman, uh, Chairman Perlmutter, and uh, Ranking Member Luke Meyer, thank you so much for having me and for the opportunity to speak today. I will say at the outset, I am the only representative of Southern Colorado here, so we can have that conversation afterwards. Um, let me just say, we're fortunate to live in a moment of extraordinary innovation that I believe can actually expand access to credit, provide consumers greater economic opportunity, and provide a more just and robust economy. As policymakers and participants in this evolution of the financial in uh, services industry, we have a responsibility to encourage responsible innovation while maintaining necessary safeguards to ensure that our system operates in the safest, soundest, and fairest way possible. Now, while my testimony goes into greater detail regarding what is driving the changes in our financial system and the implications for chartering innovative financial companies, I want to highlight a few thoughts in these remarks. First, the rise of non-bank financial services providers, and in particular fintechs, 
is the result of market forces that include the dramatic reduction of banks and branches, as has been noted already, felt most in rural and urban low and moderate income communities. And at the same time as consolidation, regulatory forces made certain consumer lending less attractive for traditional banks, and that business migrated toward non-bank providers such as payday lenders. It's against that backdrop that we think that innovative technology emerged, allowing fintech companies to develop solutions that provide consumers better alternatives to traditional banks on the one hand and strip mall financiers like payday lenders on the other. The new products provided more convenience, greater accessibility, and often were tailored more closely to consumers' personal needs and situations. Fintechs also emerged to provide back office solutions such as payments processing that operate more efficiently than comparable systems in legacy uh, banks. As a result, many products, services, and activities that were once exclusive to banks now occur outside of the banking system, where once that activity was watched closely by bank regulators, today much of it goes on outside their view. The questions that this hearing asks are whether those companies, which undeniably are providing banking products and services that historically were provided by banks, should have an equal means to compete with incumbent banks as chartered institutions, and whether providing a path for these service providers to become banks can be done in a safe, sound, and fair manner. Based on my experience and analysis, it's both necessary and advantageous to support a dual banking system of state and federal banks in which companies with novel and unique business models, powered by ever-improving technology, can compete with incumbents on a level playing field. By providing a path and allowing choice for innovators to become part of the chartered banking system, the system avoids stagnation, evolves to better meet consumer preferences, and to address business and community needs. That view previously enjoyed bipartisan champions because it's a safe and sound and thoughtful position that puts the good of the nation first and recognizes that failure to encourage responsible innovation and to welcome new participants into the banking system stifles the system, making it both anachronistic and concentrated in the hands of legacy large institutions, which have been criticized on a bipartisan basis as well. After all, fintechs have not emerged because the status quo had satisfactorily met all the needs of the economy or all the needs of consumers. I am optimistic about the progress being made to overcome bias and irrational fears toward innovative ways of meeting consumers' financial needs, including progress made uh, in transforming cryptocurrencies and blockchain applications from exotic concepts to more mainstream financial and economic tools. I am proud to have been involved in chartering the first true fintech company, Varro Bank, and to have helped clarify national bank regulations as they relate to digital assets and stablecoins. These actions have expanded services to consumers. They've allowed existing banks to explore how emerging technologies can be incorporated into their strategies of serving their customers. And they've helped provide a meaningful counterweight to the concentrated power of the largest banks in our system. Still, more rigorous than needs to be done on other important issues, particularly the appropriate measure of a sustainably profitable fintech's contribution and obligation to its community, whether it becomes a chartered bank or not. While depositories, for example, are subject to the Community Reinvestment Act and its important civil rights uh, uh, provisions, Congress did not apply the CRA to non-depository financial services providers. Policymakers thinking about chartering these non-depositories should explore alternatives to the CRA that consider other advantages that federally chartered or state licensed non-depository financial companies enjoy and what obligation that may entail to meet the important economic justice and civil rights spirit of the CRA. Recognizing that the economic inequities of the nation require the removal of barriers in addition to reinvestment, I founded Project REACH at the OCC in July 2020 to explore ways that technology innovators, banks, and civil rights leaders can work together to solve the structural issues behind race disparities, including the fact that large numbers of minorities lack usable credit scores and have more difficulty than others in saving for a house down payment. Fintech has something to say about all of these things, and if we believe that an unregulated fintech poses challenges, we should welcome them into the regulated system. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Brooks. Thank you to all of our panelists. I now recognize myself for my questions, uh, and I uh, yield myself five minutes uh, for my questions. I guess, obviously, just looking at the written materials that you all provided, uh, coupled with your testimony, I mean, we really are dealing with the length and breadth of the financial services system, the banking system, its purpose, its history, its future. And, you know, maybe that we need to have a couple follow on uh, hearings after this, because each of us is going to come at this with our life experience. I'm coming at it as a bankruptcy lawyer of 25 years who saw a lot of cycles uh, where 
businesses failed and banks failed, Colorado, Texas, uh, uh, Mr. Williams, you know, we saw pretty much every single savings and loan fail. Uh, but then we saw things grow and expand again, and we saw another cycle. And so I disagree with Mr. McHenry uh, that, uh, gee whiz, we're doing this all over again. It's because the system grows and shrinks and it gets excesses and not. And we've got to just determine how, as a policy matter, and I don't think this breaks along, you know, any party line as to whether you're conservative about the system or you you want to see it expand and take on some additional risk. Uh, all of us need to chart the the path we want to see our banking system um, follow over the next 10, 15 years, and I think that's the purpose of today's hearing and as we go forward. So. One of the big questions on industrial loan companies is about the separation of banking and commerce. And in 2005, 2006, Walmart and Home Depot unsuccessfully pursued ILC charters. There was a great deal of scrutiny from lawmakers and the public about large retail corporations offering banking services and what it could mean for market fairness and financial stability. Uh, last December, the FDIC published a rule on ILCs clarifying the parent company of the industrial bank must serve as a source of strength for the industrial bank. Professor Gerding, how well suited is the FDIC or any other regulator to assess the strength of a commercial company? And do you have concerns about the continued blending of commerce and banking? Uh, thank you, Chair Perlmutter. I, I have grave concerns about the ability of the FDIC uh, to supervise ILCs and their parents. This goes back to what I said at the end of my remarks. The FDIC does not have the authority to conduct consolidated supervision over not just the ILC and its parent, but all other entities within the corporate group. And that lack of consolidated, consolidated supervisory power does not allow the FDIC to see potential gains that conglomerates are playing with FDIC subsidized financing. It also does not allow the FDIC to see the buildup of risks within the conglomerate. And this became a problem when in the financial crisis, when we saw the parents of several ILCs require billions of dollars of government assistance. Uh, it was Goldman Sachs, uh, CIT, Merrill Lynch, Morgan Stanley, GE Capital, and GMAC all had ILCs. All of those parents did not serve as a source of strength for their ILCs, and in, by contrast, actually required billions of dollars of government intervention. So I don't think that um, the source of strength uh, argument uh, uh, gives us much comfort. Thank you. Uh, Professor Johnson. I'd like to ask you a question. Um, in 2019, the state of Wyoming enacted a series of laws related to cryptocurrency, including one authorizing the chartering of special purpose depository institutions. Last year, Wyoming approved the first SPDI charters for Kraken Bank and Avani Bank, two cryptocurrency custodial firms planning to offer services. It seems many cryptocurrency companies are eager for a legal framework to operate. Do you believe bank charters are the appropriate framework for these firms? You're muted. Thanks so much for the question, Chair. I would echo Professor Gerding's uh, comments and amplify those. Right During the financial crisis of 2008, we not only saw these challenges that were endogenous with respect to regulated firms, but exogenous challenges as well that triggered systemic risks that created losses across financial markets. I would encourage a very careful evaluation of any extension of charters to cryptocurrency-based firms because of the endogenous and exogenous shocks that could create systemic risks and destabilize financial markets. Thank you, Professor. My time has expired. I'd like to recognize the gentleman uh, from Missouri, the ranking member, Mr. Luke DeMeyer, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And just as a comment, uh, we're talking about today the headline of this uh, uh, hearing is Banking Innovation Regulatory Evasion Exploring Trends in Financial Institution Charters, and we have no representation from the banks here today. We've got several bank think tank guys and professors and 
whatever, but we have nobody representing any of the associations or any of the banks themselves. I'm kind of wondering about that. But anyway, um, it's always nice to have somebody from the real world. If the gentleman would yield for one second, I think that's I why we're going to we have to have more, uh, a couple more hearings on this. Okay, that'd be great. We look forward to having a real world aspect on this as well, besides the, the theoretical part of this. But, you know, um, it's, it's uh, interesting. Uh, Mr. Brooks, I want to start with you. Uh, again, appreciate your uh, service to our country uh, as a comptroller. I think you did a fantastic job and look forward to continuing working with you uh, in the, on the private sector side here. Um, now you're, you're talking about uh, in your testimony how the scope of a bank charter can adjust to accommodate the safe and sound delivery of traditional banking products and services by companies that are not charters banks today. Um, do you think there's a way to provide a level playing field for traditional depositories and non-banks that are providing the same services and products without requiring the non-banks to get a full national bank charter and follow all the rules and regulations? Well, so, so uh, let me just say, Mr. Lukemeyer, first of all, I very much appreciated your engagement um, during my time at the OCC. We've had some of these conversations privately, and, and let me just expand on that in answer to your question. I, th I think the answer is, that we have seen on a, on a fairly secular basis over the last 10 years, an unbundling of financial services that used to be delivered together and people want them delivered differently today. So the question really isn't, uh, do we need to create some new framework? The question is, if you have activities that have always been conducted by banks and are clearly permissible to banks and are part of the core of banking services, then the question is, why do they stop being banks when they choose to only offer some financial services. And so the way I think about the level playing field question is, if Bank of America offers a payment processing service, that is subject to a, an examination module that the OCC has for payment processors. And if Square is also uh, providing a payment processing service, it ought to be allowed to elect to be subject to the very same supervision. I think the red herring in the discussion often is the idea that somehow it's not a level playing field because Square wouldn't also be subject to deposit regulation or any of a suite of other regulations. But what I think of when I think of that issue is when I was a kid growing up in Pueblo, Colorado, I had my bank account at a small thrift in Pueblo called American Federal Savings. American Federal Savings was a bank. They were regulated by the OTS, but somehow they weren't subject to commodities and derivatives regulation like JP Morgan was not because there was an unlevel playing field, but because American Federal Savings didn't offer commodities and derivatives. So for what they did, they were subject to the very same rules and regulations as the analogous services provided at JP Morgan, but there were some things they elected not to provide and they weren't subject to those things. That's not an unlevel playing field. And so my belief is that anything that is a banking service can be accommodated inside of one of the several existing bank charters without the need for radical innovation. To me, that's common sense. Okay, let me, let me you know, Dr. Dr. Gerding made a comment here a minute ago with regards to, uh, you know, consolidation, well, uh, the separation of, of banks from commerce. It said one of us, one of the reasons in his testimony says preventing consolidation of credit, the concentration of economic power, and the concentration of political power. And to me, this is, this is why we eventually, you know, had this situation for 60 years, and then we've slowly gotten away from it. Um, and to me, this is, this is where you get the question of, on the ILCs, do we do we want to allow another commercial entity to own a, a banking entity, a uh, financial services entity, and let them creep into from the commercial side of this the banking sector? Uh, to address that, give me your thoughts on that. Yeah. So, so, so yeah. this is another place where I, uh, uh, I, I apologize. You're asking me, Luke, uh, Representative Luke Meyer. Are you asking uh, Professor Gerding? No, Mr. B Mr. Brooks. Yeah. Thoughts, I, I, I supported Mr. Gerding because it, it really, I think, it capsulizes the, the concerns that some of the folks like myself have that yeah. for 60 years yeah. we allowed, uh, we kept the banking and commercial stuff uh, apart, and now we're allowing it to get mingled together, and every day it gets mingled more and more. And I think the ILC question is one that really. Uh, solidifies this question. Do you allow commercial folks to get into the banking or not? Yeah, so 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 what I've always said about that is um, it's a very different question to ask, should Walmart be able to get an ILC versus should Affirm or Brex, which are lending companies, be able to get an ILC charter? I don't think the Walmart question is presented. I'm not personally comfortable with that. And I think the baby's out with bathwater on that if you want to mistake. Okay, thank you very much. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The gentleman's Time has expired, and I'd say to Mr. Brooks, it's a good thing you don't have an account at American Federal 
as it's one of the many savings and loans that failed back in the late 80s and early 90s. Very true. So I would now turn to the former chairman of our subcommittee, uh, Mr. Meeks from New York for five minutes. I want to thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and, and Ranking Member Lukemeyer for uh, having this very important and critical uh, hearing. Uh, this is uh, really, really just listening to the testimony of the witnesses and some of the early questions, both by you and, and Mr. Lukemeyer, uh, is, 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 is really important. And, and, and I understand uh, also that there's a debate as to whether the National Bank Act requires nationally chartered institutions to take deposits. I know that's in the course, so the courts will decide that. But look, I, I, I go back and forth myself because one of the things that I know is that uh, sometimes what we did 20, 30, 40 years ago because of technology or because of changes, you know, we've got to look at it again and figure out how do we do certain things uh, that uh, push, pushes us uh, forward. And I get the questions that I want to make sure that uh, we still have regulatory authority so that people don't run away with uh, in, in an unprotected uh, way with, because of technology. Uh, but I also want to make sure that uh, access to capital uh, is available to, uh, to many small businesses, like the small businesses uh, in my community. I talk to many uh, uh, minority, small minority businesses, et cetera. They tell me that the number one issue that they have is access to capital. So. Then, you know, I've seen the banking industry consolidate over the last 20 years while technology is now allowing for new entrants in the financial services area. And there are serious concerns that the big tech companies could enter the financial system by the ILC regime, concerns that I definitely share among uh, banks and consumer groups alike. And then if the large non-financial companies can receive uh, ILC charters, these companies could potentially receive all of the banking privileges uh, without having to answer to the same prudential standards as traditional banks, including, for example, MDIs and CDFIs. Uh, I have also, I also have though antitrust concerns when it comes to the prospect of large non-financial companies entering the system through ILC regimes. So I guess let me ask Mr. Uh, I'll start with Mr. Girding and then maybe Mr. Pacheco can jump in also. Given that the FDIC is beginning to accept applications for new ILCs for deposit insurance, can you speak to whether and how such entrants would have a competitive advantage over, for example, credit unions or minority banks? They have a credit uh, an advantage in several ways. Uh, on the one hand, they would get the benefits of uh, FDIC deposit insurance, which would allow them a cheaper cost of financing, um, which they could then spread to other parts of their con corporate conglomerate. Um, that kind of game with FDIC insurance would allow them to undercut commercial rivals. It would also allow them to enter into a banking realm uh, uh, with all the powers and privileges of banking and undercut uh, credit and small credit unions and small community banks. Um, and again, they would not be subject, as you, uh, as you said, Representative Meeks, to the same level of prudential regulation and that same all important consolidated supervision uh, that uh, traditional banks are subject to. Thank you, Mr. Brooks. Let me, let me I'm, then I'm gonna come to you, Mr. Pacheco, but let me go to Mr. Brooks anyway, real quick to see how do you counter that what Mr. Gurdon just said? Well, the, the issue I see, uh, Congressman Meeks, is the idea that um, I think all of us uh, here on the panel today are concerned about the level of concentrated power that the biggest banks have. And so I'm a believer that new entrants, whether they're fintechs or other kinds of companies, as long as they meet the statutory requirements are a counterbalance to that. So, so again, this one of the points of Project REACH was to find ways of bringing technology companies into the solution for why isn't there more capital available in inner city neighborhoods and why have banks pulled more branches out of inner city neighborhoods than out of rich suburbs? Somebody's got to fill that void. It hasn't been the big banks, so it needs to be somebody. And to me, the safest way to do that is not to allow fintechs to do it on a completely unsupervised and unregulated basis. It's to bring them into the fold subject to supervision. That, that to me is sort of a common sense solution. Let me give Mr. Pacheco, jump in there, Mr. Pacheco. Well, yeah, credit. I was, 
I appreciate that. Thank you for the question, uh, um, Congressman. I would say that uh, I would agree with uh, some of the testimony from Professor Gurdon and uh, Mr. Brooks. My, my one deviation from that is that organizations like credit unions, like my size, a small organization of just a billion and a half assets is out there going in those communities that, that might have been left behind by other institutions. We're out there building relationships in places like Pueblo uh, and other parts of Colorado. I'm out of time. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Meeks. Uh, uh, now the chair will recognize the gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Barr, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And as my friend, Mr. Meeks, focused on urban banking deserts, let me uh, ask a few questions about rural uh, banking deserts, and in particular, uh, the decline in de novo charters. Since the financial crisis de novo formation has slowed significantly, there were 181 charters granted in 2007, but between 2010 and 2019, fewer than 10 new banks on average opened per year. More than half of the counties in the United States saw net declines in the number of bank branches between 2012 and 2017. These declines in bank branches disproportionately hit rural communities. The negative financial impacts on rural counties of bank branch closures, closures are perpetuated by continuing difficulties due to burdensome regulations and other roadblocks of de novo community bank formation. These trends leave residents of rural counties without access to much needed financial services and also have negative downstream impacts on those communities. I'm trying to remedy that by introducing today the Promoting Access to Capital and Underbanked Communities Act, which would encourage formation of new banks in locations where bank branches are scarce. It would give de novo banks more time to meet capital requirements and ease other regulatory burdens on new community financial institutions. Uh, Mr. Brooks, I, I share in uh, Mr. Luchtemeyer's uh, praise of your service at the OCC. Enjoyed working with you. Can you uh, tell us what some of the biggest uh, roadblocks are to de novo bank formation? Well, um, uh, th thank you, Congressman Barr. I very much have appreciated our relationship and your uh, mentorship and guidance. So thanks for the opportunity. I, I would just begin by saying, as in many things, um, process in government is everything. And so when I first arrived at the OCC and looked at the bank chartering process, uh, the process flow involved in doing that involved something like 58 steps. I'm making that number up. There was a huge number of steps where multiple committees had to review charter applications more than one time. And uh, that was just one of the three agencies that charters banks. So I think part of the problem is that we have to streamline the process by making clear how one gets a de novo charter and making clear what the timeline expectations are for getting those things approved, even just inside of the charter agency for the OCC. The second thing I would say to this committee is we have an incredibly complicated process where three different agencies have full discretion of, over whether to approve or not approve banks because once you have a national bank charter approved at the OCC, you still need deposit insurance approval. And nowadays, the Federal Reserve is exercising extraordinary oversight over whether something that's been approved by those two agencies should be allowed to become a Fed member. That's why it took Varro Bank nearly three years from initial uh, approach to charter grant. And we can't have the kind of system we had in the 80s and 90s if we're going to take three years to charter every, um, every new uh, bank. So I share your concern that finding ways to shortcut that process, not in, not in the sense of shortcutting important substantive requirements, but shortcutting bureaucratic red tape, which takes an enormous amount of time for a good purpose, is really important. The other thing I would tell you is in rural communities, you know, fintechs are the main source of credit in certain respects. If you want to get a mortgage for sales Kentucky, you're not going to get it at a local branch. What you're going to do is find it on lending tree, and that's why it's more important that those companies be encouraged and regulated so that they can deliver those services more effectively in places banks don't have branches. Well, that, that's good uh, feedback. I, I will note uh, a recent study from the FDIC that citizens in rural communities are more likely than people in urban or suburban areas to visit bank branches. Um, uh, obviously, you, you, you mentioned uh, some online opportunities, of course, um, uh, rural broadband is a, is a challenge for uh, mobile banking. Um, I've introduced bills to combat both of these issues, but the problems have been exacerbated by the pandemic. Is there anything else we can do to increase access to the banking system for rural populations? Well, 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 so I would say, Congressman, that um, 
consistent with the bill that you're introducing today, we need to have a concept kind of like a CRA type of concept where if you are serving an underbanked community, there needs to be a fast track to approval. And I think you and I have talked before about the fact that there are, there are rural communities in Kentucky and Mississippi and other parts of the South where the nearest bank branch is 75 miles away. So the yeah. only way you're going to allow those things, those local community leaders to form new branches is if there is a fast track option. And we should see that as community reinvestment. Real quick, real quick, uh, Mr. Brooks, in my final uh, few seconds, can you address Professor Johnson's analysis that a non-depository national bank is an oxymoron? Yeah, yeah. Look, I mean, I mean, in the in the National Bank Act, uh, deposit taking is a power of a bank, not a requirement. It is a requirement in the Bank Holding Company Act, but it is a power, not a requirement, in the National Bank Act. My time has expired. I, I appreciate uh, the answers, and I yield back. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for his questions. Uh, now, I'd like to turn to the gentleman from California, uh, Mr. Sherman. Thank you. Like to first talk about the uh, industrial loan company loophole to what has been in this country. Can I be heard? You are you are live and loud. Live and loud. Thank you. Um, first, talk look at the industrial loan company loophole to what has been a prohibition in this country of mixing industry and commerce on the one hand and financial services on another. Now, a couple decades ago, we did allow different types of financial services companies to be under one roof. An insurance company can also own a bank or vice versa. Uh, but uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Carrero, uh, last month it was reported that Walmart uh, had hired a, a Goldman Sachs uh, head of consumer banking and announced a partnership uh, with Reddit Capital, uh, trying to expand into financial services. Uh, Walmart and other re, uh, major retailers have uh, at various times sought a state issued uh, industrial loan company charters um, on just as the Trump administration was on its way out the door in December of last year, FDIC adopted rules that paved the way for non-banks to own ILC chartered banks. And here's the key part, without being subject to the same regulatory oversight requirements that are applied to traditional bank holding companies. Do you see inconsistencies uh, in these regulatory requirements? And uh, is it a good idea for us to copy a system that uh, has done tremendous damage to Japan of having groups of companies that are both in industry and commerce on the one hand and financial services on the other? Thank you for your question, Congressman Sherman. Um, I believe that the Japanese example does provide some lessons. Um, they call uh, Rakuten, um, Japan's uh, Amazon, and it has integrated into financial services in a way that it will never be um, untwisted at this point. Um, I do want to highlight one dimension regarding the ILC um, issue that Professor Gruding and Professor Johnson did not hit on, um, although I believe they both point to it, at least in a general way in their testimony as well. It's that a lot of these companies that will come through this loophole will be subject to different data collection requirements. They will not be subject to regulation Y or the regulations of the BHCA in the same way, and then won't even provide the limited privacy protections that current banks do to um, their customers. So in many ways, this is replicating the problems of the past, as um, Member McHenry said, in the sense that we are creating things that look like deposits, act like deposits, walk like deposits, talk like deposits, but we don't treat like deposits. And in the other and, sense, though, this is totally and, new. And following and up on, that, on the data collection. We have a few very small old ILCs out there, but if Amazon exploits this, they're going to be enormous. They don't do anything small. And the question would then be, um, would they be subject to the Financial Stability Oversight Council if they were a systemic uh, of systemic importance to our financial system? Yeah, there are all these giant macro questions, um, which I believe um, Professor, Professor Gerding outlined quite well. And the issue to me is certainly one of power even behind that, um, Congressman Sherman. The issue is that entities like Amazon and Facebook and Walmart, which has launched the fintech, as you said, has hired um, you know, people from outfits that don't respect privacy to come in under the cloak of providing access to credit or financial inclusion even, but to do so in a way that fundamentally depends 
upon mass surveillance and a violation of our constitutional rights consistently. There are other ways to do this in which we respect privacy. There are other ways even for private sector companies to do this, let alone the government itself. And we are not addressing those ways. I'd be really interested to hear what, for instance, former acting Comptroller Brooks has to say about the Fourth Amendment. And again, the necessary violation of privacy that is the business model of these companies. For I, work. I do want to go on to one other issue. And uh, uh, Professor Garrett Gerding, I'm probably going to ask you to respond for the record, but we see that the uh, state of Wyoming is moving toward cryptocurrencies. Uh, and, uh, uh, and the OCC has granted preliminary approval to the Anchorage Trust Company to become a national uh, trust bank. And Anchorage, of course, claims to be a cryptocurrency asset custodian. I've looked at uh, Bitcoin and wondered whether there was a big enough market among terrorists, drug dealers, and it didn't seem to be enough. And then I realized when the IRS uh, commissioner testified for one trillion dollars every year of unreported taxes, chiefly from the wealthy, that uh, and I made up a little advertising sign may help Anchorage. Uh, Bitcoin, it's not just for terrorists anymore, it's for tax evaders too. That's the market for Bitcoin. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Uh, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Williams, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think one of the greatest exports America has are the products and services that our entrepreneurs and businesses bring to the marketplace and share with the world. I do not want to run the risk of losing our position as the world leader in innovation. With that being said, I do not think we should have to, or quite frankly, need to add additional risk into the financial system to help foster the business friendly regulatory environment that we need. So, Mr. Brooks, I also want to add thank you for your service to our country. And I also would ask uh, my first question is to you is how would uh, eliminating access to charting options like an ILC impact fintech companies? from innovating and creating new products and services. And do you believe that these companies would just move to uh, other jurisdictions outside of the U.S. to provide a more modernized regulatory system? Yeah, well, so, so Congressman, I really appreciate that question. And uh, I guess I would answer it in two different ways. So before we talk about offshoring technology, which is a real risk, let's just talk about the actual companies that are actually applying for ILC charters today, okay? They're not Walmart, they're not Amazon, they're not Google. They're financial companies. They're um, a firm, which is a point of sale lending company that is one of the largest uh, uh, companies in that space today. And all they do is make loans. That's their entire business. They'd like to be an ILC. So um, you have two choices in that world. That company can come into the ILC world and be supervised by a state regulator and by the FDIC or not. Okay. And so the question is, which is a riskier scenario, letting them in the system so they can be supervised. And remember that federally supervised entities fail at about half the rate of non-federally supervised entities, or we can keep them out of the system today. I would argue that is riskier. Now, if the U.S. adopts the anti-tech posture, and I think one of the comments made earlier is that we can't take the politics out of tech, what you already see is significant aspects of tech moving offshore primarily to Asia, but even, even to markets with somewhat more unified financial regulation like the UK. So comments have been made about cryptocurrency. Obviously, I disagree that the market for Bitcoin is terrorists and tax evaders. We could have that conversation separately. But the position we've taken in this country thus far about blockchain and its you know, opportunities has been a position that's led many exchanges to leave the United States. Now, there's optimism because of the Coinbase IPO yesterday that the U.S. markets are very welcoming of that business, but increasingly that activity is going to the U.K., the EU, and Singapore. And those are countries that still have an idea that perhaps responsible innovation with an appropriate amount of risk oversight is a good thing, not a bad thing. So I think we need to think carefully about that. Appreciate that answer. Uh, secondly, my office has been contacted by a variety of stakeholders talking about the importance of the true lender rule. The fact that it is being discussed as something that could be invalidated with the Congressional Review Act has already caused some market uh, participants to get nervous as they uh, are working uh, to provide services to banks that they have partnered with. I think that when uh, some of my Democratic colleagues try to simplify the rule down to saying it is just a rent-a-charter scheme, it missed the intention of the rule. So, Mr. Brooks, again, can you talk to us about how the true lender rules assist the OCC and protecting the safety and stability of our nationally uh, chartered uh, banks. 
Yeah, so, so Congressman, that's a great question. And um, there were two motivations behind the true lender rule and its companion rule, the valid when made rule. The, the first idea was that when the Madden decision came down in the Second Circuit Court of Appeals, lending to low and moderate income people living in New York and Connecticut, the state subject to that rule, fell by 64%. Let, let me just say that again. When you don't have the valid when made rule, the people who get hurt are poor people. And the point of the rule was to reinstate access to credit for those low and moderate income Americans, our brothers and sisters, who were cut off from credit when banks weren't allowed to sell loans in the secondary market. That was the first reason. The second thing we did in that rule is make very clear uh, that rent-to-charter schemes of the past, which were all about the idea that nobody was accountable for those loans, not the bank and not the fintech marketing partner, those were over. What we said in our rule was that in the true lender regime, if the bank is the true lender on the loan, it will be responsible for all disclosure, all anti-discrimination rules, all consumer protections. We eliminated rent-to-charter in that rule. So it's a nice talking point to say that somehow this incentivizes rent-to-charter, but in fact, the text of the rule solves rent-to-charter and staff and career over, uh, you know, supervisors at the agency worked very hard to make sure that was the case. Thank you for that. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield the remainder of my time back. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Uh, another gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I greatly appreciate the opportunity to be heard and greatly appreciate your having this hearing. Uh, it's been very valuable to me. Let me start with uh, Coinbase and their predicate for where I'd like to uh, ultimately end up. Coinbase made its uh, market debut Wednesday, and um, its reference price was $250. It ended up closing at $328.28. The value of the company is at $85.7 billion. Uh, for those I'm sure you know, but some may not know that Coinbase is um, a business that allows its uh, clients, its customers to buy and sell digital currency. I mention this uh, because it's just a matter of coincidence, I suppose, and I don't want to mean anybody, but Mr. Bernie Madoff, he passed yesterday. And uh, Mr. Bernie Madoff, for those who may have forgotten, was the father of a $20 billion Ponzi scheme. A lot of people have consternation about digital currency, cryptocurrency, because they're concerned that it might end up being a Ponzi scheme. This is a fear that people have. People who don't understand, maybe, but uh, some who do understand, very much concerned. Uh, my concern is this. When Mr. Madoff made off with this money, uh, persons who, generally speaking, could care less about what Congress does as long as Congress kind of stays out of their business, they made their way to Congress and they wanted Congress to help. They thought we should have regulated to the extent that this fraud should not have occurred. And I think that a lot of our concern and consternation with cryptocurrency emanates from people who saw what happened and still are concerned about what may happen. So here's my first question, and I'd like to, to take, the, take uh, this uh, question to Mr. Brooks. My first question is this, Mr. Brooks. Um, is, uh, is cryptocurrency an asset class or is it a substitute for currency? How do you see it? And can you just give me a quick answer, maybe 10, 15 seconds, because I have another question for you. <clears throat> sure, so, so Congressman Green, I really appreciate the question. Um, uh, I separate crypto into two worlds, Bitcoin and everything else. Bitcoin, I think of as an asset class. It is an anti-inflationary asset class that some people believe is a counterweight to inflationary monetary policy by governments. All of the other cryptocurrencies that exist out there are designed to create networks. They're essentially inducements to create internets on which various values can be exchanged. I'm happy to talk more about that, but it's an internet protocol. It has nothing to do with Ponzi schemes. And tell me how much time you want. I can give you more information on that. I appreciate what you've said thus far. Let me move forward. Um, the American dollar is backed by the full faith and credit of the <clears throat> United States of America. That's a fair statement, I think. 
uh, cryptocurrency seem to be backed by the people who hold cryptocurrency. Uh, is that a fair statement? I, I, I don't think so, actually. I think I probably disagree with both of those statements. Okay. Okay. Well, explain, please. Okay. So, sure. So what's backed by the full faith and credit of the United States is U.S. debt. Okay. A, a dollar bill is not U.S. debt. A dollar bill is just a unit of exchange you use to buy things with. Um, if you look at what's happened in monetary policy over the last 12 months, the U.S. has increased the M2 money supply by 40% which inherently devalues the amount of the, uh, the purchasing power of the dollar. You saw that in the inflation reports that were in this morning's newspapers. So that's an example of the dollar not being backed by the full faith and credit. It's backed by, by American monetary policy at any given moment. Uh, um, so there's the that. Cryptocurrency, if you look quickly. Cryptocurrency. Right. So, so, so cryptocurrency, um, again, put Bitcoin aside just for a moment. What cryptocurrency is about is the belief that a particular network will gain adoption. So it's, it's, you know, when you buy an Ethereum token, an ETH token, that's like saying, I believe this network, which is a smart contract protocol for building financial applications, it basically apps like on your cell phone, is going to have value. So if you think Google stock has value because you think internet traffic is going to go up and Google is a tracking stock for the internet, buying ETH tokens is like believing that the Ethereum protocol will become the default protocol for financial applications. That, that's what it's backed by is adoption rates of that protocol. But if, if it's backed by the belief, and I, I do concur with this, um, is there the possibility of believers at some point no longer believing can take it to zero? Sure, sure. J just as believers, you know, in general, can say hey, that's the past was the future, so I'm dumping my General Motors stock. Thank that could happen too. My time is expired. Representative Green, may I clarify a point of law? Well, uh, the chairman would have to allow you to do so. My time uh, is expired. Uh, without objection, uh, you got uh, 30 seconds. Thank you. Um, former Acting Controller Brooks said that the U.S. dollar is not government debt. That is incorrect. It is an issue of the U.S. Federal Reserve. It is classified as a liability on its balance sheet. It comes from an instrumentality of Congress, although it is not considered under the debt ceiling to be treated the same way as a U.S. Treasury. It is very much a debt of the United States government. It is money we owe to ourselves. It is our main payment tool constitutionally and administratively. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. Uh, I think uh, next we have the gentleman from uh, Georgia, uh, Mr. Loudermill, for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Mr. Brooks, before I get in my questions, I just want to know if you, if you needed a moment, a uh, few seconds to respond to the, the previous gentleman. Yeah, I mean, I mean, look, I, I, I guess all I would say on that is that um, uh, dollars are created by government credit operations. And so the underlying thing that is an obligation is the credit, right? It's the buying and selling of government debt. But the dollar that you have in your pocket, and any of us old enough to remember the 70s know this, it's only as valuable as American monetary policy. I remember 1980 when interest rates were 13% and when it cost 21% to take out a mortgage. Your dollar wasn't very valuable then and nobody guaranteed its value. Well, I'd appreciate the clarification of that. In fact, recently I was at a restaurant and uh, the waitress had just taken cash and she handed me a, a bill and she said, can you tell me if this is legal? It was a silver certificate. I said, I'll tell you what, I'll give you a bill of equal value and I'll take it. So. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I, I do want to uh, follow up on the questions of Mr. Williams regarding fintech and true lender. Um, you know, bank uh, fintech partnerships have continued to grow, and the question of which entity is the true lender is the subject of numerous court cases, and, and it's been resolved on a case by case basis in a lot of instances. Some courts have developed complicated multi factor tests to determine who is the true lender. Uh, but that causes significant confusion and uncertainty in lending markets. So, Mr. Brooks, can you discuss why the OCC's, tr uh, OCC's true lender rule is important to give clarity and certainty to the lending markets? Well, so, so Congressman, it's a great question, and it's all about how important you think clarity is. So <laughs> the philosophy I have, which I articulated at the OCC many times, was to quote Justice Brandeis's famous statement when he said, sometimes it's more important that a question be settled than that it be settled right. And so my belief is that lending contracts in a big global economy like the American economy need a rule. You could pick a different rule, but our point was to say someone needs to be responsible. There needs to be a clear, bright line test when a consumer takes out a loan as to who he's taking the loan out from. And so our, our belief was we'll have a two sentence rule. 
The bank is the lender if its name's on the note, or the bank is the lender if it funded the note on the date of origination, period. And we will take enforcement action against any bank who is the true lender who violates the law. Hard to see how that's not a good thing. Right. And, you know, some on the other side of you've heard over and over again today have alluded to that the uh, the true lender rule will allow predatory lenders to engage in rent a charter schemes. And that is a concern of even some bank uh, state level uh, bank examiners or uh, directors. Can you explain how that rule does not allow for that? Yeah. Well, so the first thing is, you know, we need to sort of take the adjectives and adverbs out of this discussion and start defining some terms. So when people call a loan a predatory loan, the question is, what do they mean by that? And what they generally mean is it was a loan that was originated at an interest rate that exceeds the borrower's home state's usury cap. Okay, let's let's just define some terms. So if that's what you mean by predatory lending, Congress and the Supreme Court between 1978 and 1980 made clear that banks, both national banks and state banks, have the ability to export their home state's interest rate to other states. And why was that important as a policy matter? Because again, in the late 70s, the market rate of money was in the high double digits and the state usury cap in some states was in the single digits, meaning that if you lived in that state and you didn't have interest rate exportation, you literally couldn't borrow money. That's not a good thing in the market cycle, right? And so the, I think the argument is, when Congress decided that banks can export their interest rate, they decreed that that's not predatory lending. So the question is, why does it become predatory lending when a loan that was legal when made is sold to somebody else? The analogy I give is if you're renting an apartment and you have a lease that says you have to pay $500 a month, and then the building owner sells it to a different owner and your lease is still $500 a month, what's changed? Did that rent suddenly become unaffordable? Did it suddenly become usurious? No, you live in the same apartment and you contracted to pay that amount. And in the 70s and 80s, we all recognized it was a good thing. In my testimony, I talk about what a bipartisan consensus that was to allow rate exportation. All true lender does is make those markets work better, provide clarity, reduce litigation, and make credit more available. Remember, in the two states, they have that rule for five years. Credit to low and moderate income people fell by 64%. That can't be what we want. Well, it's, and access to credit is really what the issue is, especially in a recovering economy when people are trying to uh, get back into the workforce or become an entrepreneur and start a new business. And as you know, bank fintech partnerships has resulted in tremendous expansion of the availability of credit, not just for those who have good credit, but also, also those with limited credit history. Um, can you explain why adding more uncertainty in the lending markets will reduce access to credit for consumers and businesses? Well, I'd ask the chairman. Uh, the gentleman, the gentleman's question. Uh, look, I gave 30 seconds last time. You got another 30 seconds. Sorry. Thank you. So, yeah, so, so thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would just quickly say that if a bank can't engage in fintech and other par partnerships to sell loans in the secondary market, the bank's ability to provide credit is limited by the size of its own balance sheet, right? Because it can't sell that loan and then use the proceeds to make the next loan. When a bank is limited by the size of its own balance sheet, not surprisingly, it's going to focus on the safest and most profitable loans, which mean loans to the richest people and the people with the best credit scores. So the first people who get hurt when credit starts getting rationed are poor people. Again, you know, the Federal Reserve has done multiple studies showing that more credit equals less poverty. And my philosophy is that making credit markets work for everybody ought to be our highest priority. Well said, and I yield back the remaining time I no longer have. Gentlemen's time has expired and, you know, if we get a chance, maybe we'll do a lightning round for everybody after this, but we're basically dealing with the whole banking system and a number of different issues related to it. So I now would like to recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Dr. Foster for five minutes. Bill, well, you got on mute. Apologies. Um, so I'd like to uh, ask a couple questions about what's going on in Wyoming, which seems to be a state that has more senators than they have actual people. Um, but in 2019, the state of Wyoming enacted a series of laws related to cryptocurrency, including one authorizing the charter of a special purpose depository institutions, or SPDIs. And in September, Wyoming approved the first SPDI application for Kraken Bank, uh, which is a digital asset company based in Cheyenne. Uh, the bank uh, plans to offer services such as digital asset custody, 
demand deposit accounts, wire transfer services. Um, and at this time, it seems that the Kraken Bank is not seeking deposit insurance from the FDIC. And instead, the bank has promised that it will maintain 100% reserves of deposits in fiat currency and in liquid assets. Now, the rules of the Wyoming Banking Division define liquid assets to include investment grade corporate debt, investment grade U.S. state and municipal securities, and other in um, and other uh, investment grade uh, federal or state government agency securities. Um, so under stressful events, some of these instruments would make that arrangement inherently unstable, uh, such as when you have an interest rate swing and, and treasury bond prices would fall or corporate uh, you know, credit risk may increase and in causing capital losses. And so um, Ms. Johnson, do you have concerns that this model of capitalization may not be robust enough to withstand periods of economic stress? Thank you so much, Representative, for the question. I do have strong concerns. Um, and I, I'd like to sort of situate this conversation um, in reference to the 2008 financial crisis. And in the moment, it may not be the case that Kraken is soliciting federal deposit insurance. But however, uh, should Kraken or other, was referenced earlier, uh, Coinbase, um, other cryptocurrency exchanges or platforms operating in this space experience significant solvency crises, we should not assume that they would not be eligible for some type of relief. I would point in this moment to the Fed's discount window being made available to AIG. Um, and in the moment that the Fed's discount window was being made available to AIG to an earlier point in conversation, I was leaving a position as Associate General Counsel at J.P. Morgan Chase. Uh, it was within weeks of us acquiring another bank, now defunct, but had a long history, Bear Stearns. Um, and I'd like to just underscore that there is more than sufficient evidence in the cryptocurrency space already that exchanges not only experience solvency crises, but they are subject to cyber attacks that have left them um, in a, unable to satisfy uh, uh, customer deposits. Um, they've been also subject to any number of scams and misconduct more broadly. Well, thank you. And I'd uh, like to also uh, talk a little bit about their, their capitalization. Uh, the Wyoming SBDI guide, capital guidance states that a prospective SBDI should consider uh, one and a quarter to one and three quarter percent of proposed asset under management or assets on, uh, you know, asset, or assets under custody or $10 million, whichever is greater, as an appropriate minimum requirement for chartering. However, you know, these requirements are, have been will be developed on a case-by-case -case basis. The banks under supervision of a federal banking agency are required to maintain b basic minimum capital requirements that translate to a percentage of assets. And furthermore, traditional banks have other key protections such as deposit insurance or access to a lender of last resort. Uh, Professor Gerding, since the SPDIs uh, do not have deposit insurance or lender of last resort, would you consider SPDIs to be adequately capitalized under the Wyoming Banking Division's general formula? It, it, it's very difficult to say, uh, Representative Foster, because of that, that critical phrase that you mentioned in your remarks, a case-by-case -case basis. Um, it, it's hard to know whether um, the the way in which Wyoming regulators will actually look at applicants for these charters um, in a consistent way and in a way that actually makes sure, ensures that they're well capitalized. And I w wonder that, I worry that a lot of these decisions are going to be made uh, in a case-by-case -case basis and in a very non-transparent way. All right. So that's, uh, that's actually a valuable thing to keep our eyes on. So I appreciate that. Um, just a, a quick question, um, you know, on a big issue with uh, crypto generally, fintech generally, is the whole business of know your customer and uh, your the ability to use uh, to for customers to uh, to basically prove who they are online. And there are proposals that are being made and actually done in some states uh, that um, that consumers will have access to so-called digital driver's licenses to prove who they are online. Um, do you have any comments on how that may make the whole KYC AML situation improve, no matter what the charter you adopt? The, the gentleman's question will require a long time to answer, and I would ask that uh, either we do it in a lightning round or you submit it in writing and the panelists can answer your question. I appreciate that, Mr. Chair, yield back. 
Gentleman's time has expired. Thank you. Uh, gentleman from Tennessee, uh, Mr. Kustoff is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for holding today's hearing. And I do want to thank the witnesses for appearing as well. Mr. Pacheco, if I, if I can to you, the obviously the last 12 and 13 months has uh, created a lot of new normals, a lot of new habits. Can you talk about from your customer's perspective what you've seen in, in terms of changing of preference and maybe changing of, of habits accelerated by the by the pandemic? Sure. Uh, thank you for the uh, question, Congressman. Uh, the last 12, 14 months has been uh, very disruptive. Uh, it's been disruptive for our in-lobby transactions and traffic, and we've had to shift to other avenues and sources and solutions, and that includes things like mobile banking, online banking, desktop banking, uh, certainly a higher utilization of telephone banking, uh, and, uh, you know, in a last resort perspective, refer, uh, re utilizing uh, drive-through banking. So it's been very disruptive. In each of those cases, you know, we've used solutions that we've partnered with other companies on. Our mobile banking platform would be a great example. I think that's, uh, that's the current, that's some of the current things we're doing relative to uh, technology innovation to be able to drive that, and then also including mobile deposits on that platform. And so the, the partnerships that we've had have been a, a uh, welcome and received uh, benefits to our membership during the pandemic. Thank you, Mr. Pacheco. If, Mr. Brooks, if I could uh, for you, and I do want to echo uh, other people who, who uh, thank you for your prior service to the, to the government. I appreciate your opening statement. I also appreciate your, your written statement. Can you talk about kind of following up on Mr. Pacheco, the, the change in the way uh, customers now operate in this environment, and and what does it say about the future of the financial industry? Yeah, well, so so Congressman, that is a great question, and I appreciate Mr. Pacheco's comments uh, as well. I think one of the reasons it's great to have a credit union representative on this panel is that it shows to meet the credit needs of Americans, particularly in a post-pandemic sort of contactless environment, it's going to be all hands on deck. So the answer clearly is not that the biggest banks alone can solve all of our credit problems. Um, indeed, Jamie Dimon just said in his annual investor letter last week that the role and relevance of banks in the economy is the smallest it's been at any time in the last you know, number of decades because customers' preferences have changed. Most people, and, and I think Congressman Barr has it right, there's a real urban-rural divide on this, but most people in the United States have elected not to visit bank branches. I mean, just ask any of you, when was the last time you went into a, a branch for a significant transaction? And the pandemic has accelerated that kind of thing. So you have a combination of many people want to do things from home, like we're doing this hearing today. Many people don't want to interact with other people that they don't know in day-to-day -day interactions. And a significant amount of capital has fled the banking system for other applications. This is why fintech valuations are now higher than bank valuations on a revenue multiple basis over the last five year period. And so in that world where capital has left banking and consumer preferences have shifted to other kinds of platforms, the policy question is, how do we make sure the system is still safe and sound and consumer protections are respected? That, that's the question. There's no one answer. It's not going to be to keep all fintechs out of banking. That's not going to be the answer. It's not going to be to, to say crypto must be you know, banned because it's a source of terrorism financing now that it's a two and a half trillion dollar market. What it's going to be is an all hands on deck attempt to make sure that we regulate similar activities similarly, regardless of whether that activity takes place on a legacy bank platform, a fintech platform, a crypto platform or whatever. If you're doing payments, you should be subject to payments regulation. If you're engaging in credit, you should be subject to the fair lending laws and it shouldn't matter whether you're a legacy depository or something else, consumer preferences change and the system you all regulate has to evolve with that. Thank you. I, and you mentioned Congressman Barr and I, I want to follow up on his line of questioning and also uh, the comments that you made in your in your written statement, at least about the, the de novo banks and the lack thereof over the last X number of years and the closure of, of, of bank branches. You know, my district, I represent part of Memphis, but also a fairly rural part of Tennessee. I traveled across the district quite a bit. Uh, and what I heard was we have a lack of rural broadband. Uh, we have a lack of broadband. And uh, as we talk about the the continued emergence of, of fintech, how do we mesh that together? How, how can the how can the fintechs fill the void 
of some of these closures, and yet our communities not have broadband. Congressman, that's the all hands on deck point. We need a combination of it needs to be easier to charter new banks and it needs to be easier for fintechs to fill voids. We need all of that. Thank you very much. I, my time is up and I yield back. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kustoff. Um, the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Lawson, is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to welcome uh, everybody to the committee. It's been a very good discussion. I'm, I'll probably, if I have time, I'll go back to Mr. Brooks and Mr. Brooks. The reason why I said that is because, you know, I have a lot of students uh, in my district, you know, and, and they're much younger and they don't want to go in the banks. But some of the, the other citizens uh, uh, around my age and stuff, they still want to go in these branch banks, banks and sit down and talk to them. But I, I really need to get this uh, message. I hope I can come back to you. Uh, I noticed that Professor Gergen. Uh, in uh, his real testimony, he stated that he wrote in the separation between banking and, 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 and commerce proposed risk for financial stability uh, and consumer protection are threatened to distort a financial market by allowing commercial firms that can obtain banking power and privilege to compete unfairly with the firms that cannot. And secondly, distort banking markets by allowing non-banks to offer banking services uh, without facing the same degree of supervision and regulation as bank, which in turn would create incentives for banks to take more risk, uh, lobby for deregulation. Can you please explain those three points for me, sir? Uh, thank you. Uh, let me explain the last piece first. Um, when you undermine the bank charter, um, when you allow competitors to unfairly compete with banks uh, without being subject to the same uh, set of regulations, and when you give all of the powers and privileges of a bank to a non-bank, that has an effect on bank behavior as well. And it's just core banking economics. When you undermine the bank charter and allow unfair competition, banks are going to respond by taking more risk. And that's partially what we've seen in the last 20 years and, part, and a big part of what we saw in the global financial crisis. So that's the effect on the banking sector. On the commercial sector, by allowing non-banks to get powers and privileges of banks, including exemptions from a whole host of state laws, which uh, Mr. Brooks has not really mentioned, um, you're allowing the, the firms that have charters to basically get to undercut their rivals in commercial markets and allowing commercial firms and non-banks to have access to things like Federal Reserve emergency loans and the Federal Reserve payment systems without being subject to the same uh, set of regulations and the same duties of banks and functions of banks you're basically uh, distorting commercial markets, non-banking markets. That's incredible. Uh, 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 Mr. Brooks, uh, before my time ran out, and you talk about the change in market and the way uh, individuals like to uh, do banking and, and really don't like to observe. Where, where people in 50 or 60 and above, you know, uh, uh, I don't know whether you address those groups, but maybe they're coming along as much as the younger people, because I noticed in a lot of where we have a lot of students and stuff in my area, maybe 50 or 60,000 of them, it's a whole different story uh, in terms of how they go into bank in the future. And so I don't care, I don't know where you have time to comment on that and looking at the trends, uh, but uh, I better stop right now for my time run out and give you a chance to respond. A absolutely. Well, Congressman Lawson, I really appreciate the question. Um, I, so I'd make a couple of comments. I mean, first of all, there's clearly generational changes in preferences. So like I'm, I'm the youngest person you know who still writes checks. You know, nobody does that anymore. And my kids aren't aware of what a check is. So there's a little bit of that where people just like doing things on their phones. But there's also something that's more fundamental going on here. And that is that banks, um, as part of a business model uh, decision, have retreated from areas that they used to serve better than they do today. So, for example, more consumer lending happens outside of banks than inside of banks. That, that would have been shocking 25 years ago. But today, the percentage of consumer loans being delivered is, is being done on fintech and other non-bank platforms, not supervised by the OCC or any other federal regulator. So why is that? It's, it's because the cost involved in a big bank 
underwriting somebody for a $5,000 personal loan to replace their hot water heater isn't worth the input cost. And so they've that. And so, you know, what I find just interesting about the discussion is there seems to be the belief that legacy banks are, are somehow the only legitimate source of financing. And yet the market tells us otherwise. They're not serving the needs of sort of average Americans the way that they used to. And so fintechs and others have come in to fill the gap. My belief is that activity ought to be supervised. It ought to be safe and sound the way that other things are. And we shouldn't fetishize what the word bank has historically conjured up. It's not what the statute says. It's not the way it's always been. And I think Congress needs to recognize the market. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lawson. Uh, now we'll go to uh, Mr. Rose from Tennessee for five minutes. Good morning and thank you, uh, Chairman Perlmutter and Ranking Member Luke Meyer for holding this hearing today. Uh, Mr. Brooks, welcome back to the committee and thank you uh, to all of our witnesses for being here uh, with us today. Uh, as we discuss financial institution charters, I think it important that we avoid revisiting outdated regulations and instead look to the future. Technology and innovation have increased access to financial services for many Americans, and it is important that we provide clear rules of the road to allow for continued growth in this space. A large portion of my district in Middle Tennessee is rural. In addition to having to travel further distances to obtain banking services, rural communities have seen increased costs in accessing financial services in part due to branch closures. As of the third quarter of 2020, there were 13,000 fewer banks in rural communities than in the 1980s. And although our community banks are doing their absolute best to serve our communities, rural areas continue to face the long-term effects of these closings. Mr. Brooks, could you discuss how FinTechs could help in, uh, could step in to try and fill that gap in rural communities? Yeah, absolutely. So, so Congressman, um, first of all, I'll just say, and, and with no offense to the chairman, that although I am from Colorado, I did spend my first five years living in uh, just outside of Paris, Tennessee. So these issues actually sort of resonate with me in a, in a personal way. And I would also say that fintech is not the solution for every problem under the sun, but it is a solution as part of an all hands on deck approach. Okay. So the thing about fintechs is fintechs are able to bring capital sources that are outside of your community into your community. And historically, the way that a rural uh, area would be served is you'd have a local community bank, it would have a couple of branches, its deposits would all have been sourced from the local community, and then those deposits would be reinvested into loans to, to borrowers, whether they were, you know, agricultural loans to farmers or whether they were small business loans to the mom and pop uh, cafe on Main Street or, or whatever. The problem with that is, as America has disinvested from rural communities over the last 30 years on kind of a long-term basis, that kind of capital, even if you had a bank branch, is probably not sufficient to serve the credit needs of places like your district. And so one of the advantages that fintech offers, and I would argue actually over the long term, one of the advantages that crypto offers, is it unlocks sources of capital that are far, far away from your communities, right? And it is able to deliver them over the internet to any credit worthy person who happens to live in middle Tennessee. And, and that is, I guess, my main point is there may not be enough capital there to justify a de novo bank, and yet there may be credit worthy people who need to access capital sourced elsewhere. During your time at the OCC, you focused on increasing access to charters for fintechs. Could you describe the barriers to entry for new firms looking to get into payments or lending? Yeah, well, so so if you if you put aside the bank charter, OK, and you wanted to start a payments company, let's say you wanted to start Stripe today. Uh, the first thing you have to do is you have to go and obtain 50 money transmitter licenses in all 50 states. And that takes a lot of time. It's incredibly expensive. The legal compliance costs that are different from state to state become very difficult because, you know, some states mandate things that are literally prohibited in another state. And so finding a way to do that uh, is extremely difficult. Generally speaking, and I, and I guess I do want to speak for a moment to the uh, state law preemption point that was raised a moment ago, just so that I can I can say that I spoke to it. Back in the early days of the Republic, when there was a debate about whether the you know, federal government should assume the state's revolutionary war debts or whether we should have the first bank of the United States, we had this discussion. And the reason that Alexander Hamilton won that debate, as opposed to the Jeffersonians, is because of a belief that if we're going to have a big economy, big enough to compete with the powers of Europe, or in these days, the powers of Asia, 
we don't have the luxury of suffocating our businesses, our big businesses anyway, with different state by state regulation. That's why in the 70s, Congress enacted rate exportation is because of a belief that you don't want Illinois to be able to kill commerce because it, and I'm just making up Illinois, it has a different view of interest rates or banking charters or anything else compared to Indiana, right? That doesn't make sense. We're a big unified nation. And as companies grow and operate on an interstate basis, the idea of getting 50 state charters to operate your payment company doesn't really make a ton of sense. I, I don't think Hamilton would think it made a ton of sense. In the few moments that I have uh, left, if you will, uh, I'll, I'll ask this question. In your testimony, you emphasized how there has been a lack of new bank charters in 10 years. Can you explain the benefits of increasing the number of charters, uh, whether yeah. for traditional or online banks? For, for, for sure. I mean, most Americans still feel most comfortable opening up their account in a bank branch. There are certain transactions they need to talk to a banker. It's not fair to see how we've lost the muscle granting. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we will now go to the gentleman from Illinois so he can defend his state, uh, Mr. Huh. Kasten, for five minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this has really been a great hearing. Um, you know, I think you undersold it when you said we're trying to learn about the whole banking industry. We're also trying to learn about um, monetary theory. Um, um, it's uh, it's hard to do this all in five minutes. Um, I want to um, just start with sort of two statements that I think we all agree with on this um, panel. Number one, there's been a tremendous amount of good and necessary and entrepreneurial innovation in the fintech space, which is fantastic and has, uh, um, let's make sure we don't squelch that. Number two, there isn't a company in the world that comes before us and says, I would like to have more regulation. Um, and, and I mention that because particularly with some of the emerging fintech players, we hear all the time when they come before us what they're not. I'm not an ETF, I'm not a bank, I'm not a credit rating agency, I'm not a credit card company. Um, we very rarely hear them say what they are because for them to say what they are would be for them to implicitly say, and therefore I would like to be regulated under the following structure. And I think the value of this hearing is getting some clarity on what they actually are. Um, Ms. Johnson, I got two kind of big questions for you, and I and I preface that by saying I'm probably going to cut you off before you finish the first one, and I apologize in advance for that. But in your um, in, in your remarks, you said that the, the OCC and the FDIC take steps to allow firms to engage in banking activities while being subject to less regulation and supervision, and, uh, and that the OCC lacks the authority to charter non-depository national banks. Now, if, if, if we think just about sort of the distinction between those fintech firms that are doing one small thing, as Mr. Brooks mentioned, you know, maybe a payment processing firm, and those in the big tech space that are doing this whole array of consumer credit, financial transaction services, setting aside the current legal authority, who do you think should regulate those? And how would you think about that And um, in a minute or so, so I can get to my next question? Representative Kasson, I think that's a great question. I think the first point is the one you made. What exactly is being regulated? I think we must pin the firms down and in the very least require them to describe the regulatory regime they believe they should be subject to based on their activities. Otherwise, they engage in regulatory arbitrage which is the purpose of this hearing. You can evade tax, you can evade securities law if you arbitrage your activities in a manner that avoids the, the application of regulation, to your point. Um, so thank you. And if you have more thoughts, I'd love to follow up with you because that is sort of, that's at the core of all these conversations. Um, the, the second question gets into, and I, I said at the start that we're having conversations that are really almost about monetary theory right now. Um, you know, I think there's, a lot of the underlying logic for Bitcoin is, you know, they're, they're old hard money, gold, gold bug kind of arguments. And we don't need to get into all that right now. But we have a financial regulatory structure that is designed to ensure that there's sufficient liquidity in the market and in your bank that when you go to withdraw something, the cash is there. Um, if you deposit tulip bulbs in your bank, the bank doesn't loan out 80 percent of your tulip bulbs and make sure it's all there. They, that's in a safe deposit box. But. But as we've had things like this recent situation um, um, in, in this, this bank in Anchorage, that's a, you know essentially a, a, a crypto company, how should we be thinking about what the role of the regulator is to ensure that holding increasingly volatile assets on a balance sheet 
doesn't compromise the liquidity of the system, particularly as the volume of those assets grows. Representative, I think this is a great question. And I think we only have to look at the movement in the price of Bitcoin from the moment that um, COVID-19 was declared a global pandemic to today and watch the movement in the value of that single asset, right, in an asset class to identify an example of the problem you just described. If we are allowing banks to uh, hold and uh, count or calculate reserves based on this asset class, I think we really have to fundamentally revisit, interrogate, and clearly understand uh, how we set those valuations and the rules and regulations that apply to this new asset class. I say that as a student, as a teacher, uh, and as a former practitioner engaged in the development of credit derivatives, which I cre uh, credit default swap specifically, or at the heart of the most recent financial crisis. And part and parcel of the problem there was a misunderstanding, a fundamental misunderstanding of the potential liability that this new class of assets could create. Well, thank you. And I'd, I'd love to follow up on that as well. Mr. Mr. Carrillo, with the few moments left here, did you have any follow on thoughts on that? Yes, I would just like to note that um, this is all an environment for volatility and instability, as Professor Johnson said. Um, we keep hearing about going back to the good old days of the 80s, but that's when banking was especially wild to me, and it hurt marginalized communities specifically. Thank you. I yield back. Gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, Mr. Budd from North Carolina is recognized for five minutes. I thank the chair. You know, uh, Mr. Brooks, today we're seeing a lot of innovative products in the form of digital assets, decentralized finance, uh, which could be revolutionary for the banking system. You know, we had Coinbase's direct listing yesterday, so it's obvious that this technology isn't going away. You know, we're now at the crossroads of embracing this technology or falling behind other countries. One of my great concerns is that uh, we get surpassed by other countries that are more willing to engage on this. So Mr. Brooks, here's my question is, do you see a world where we can have an intersection of legacy banking, uh, what we know of as banking, and also uh, DeFi by allowing banks to use like blockchain protocols and use that to eliminate in inefficiencies and offer better products and services to consumers? Well, uh, well Congressman, Congressman Bud, uh, uh, thank you for the question, and uh, and also thank you for all of your engagement during my time at the OCC. I've I've always loved these conversations, and I've learned a lot from them. Um, specifically, your question. Let me start with the legacy bank part of things. Okay, so one of the reasons at the OCC that we started focusing on crypto regulatory issues is because of the fact that two or three of the largest banks in the United States were already exposed to various crypto activities to to the tune of billions of dollars. So, for example, at, at the time that I walked into the OCC, JP Morgan, you know, had deposits of, you know, exceeding a billion dollars backing a stablecoin project, but there was no federal guidance on how stablecoins ought to be thought about. Uh, State Street uh, was doing it likewise for another stablecoin project, and there were smaller banks, uh, Silvergate and Cross River and some others that were providing other kinds of support services for, for crypto assets. So it's very clear that there's a lot of interest uh, from traditional companies in crypto. And you see that from the fact that Intercontinental Exchange has started its own crypto exchange, that Goldman Sachs is now restarting their crypto desk, that Fidelity has created a digital asset custodian. And Anchorage, you know, another bank that, by the way, doesn't have these assets on their balance sheet. They are a custody bank that holds those assets for third parties. That's a fee for service business, not an asset heavy business. Um, but the point of all of those things is to say that banks have traditionally provided uh, the role of safeguarding and safekeeping their clients' assets, and crypto is another asset that has come along in the last 10 years and has now achieved scale. So clearly the legacy institutions have a role to play. In terms of technologies like DeFi and, and payments in the form of stable coins and other kinds of things, these are the kinds of technologies that bring internet technology to finance the way that the original internet uh, brought those decentralization benefits to information sharing first and to regular commerce second. So I think one of the biggest misunderstandings about, about crypto, uh, which I think is really important to understand is we're building a second internet here. The whole point of crypto tokens having value is to induce people to provide computing power to maintain a decentralized network that otherwise would be maintained by Google and Facebook, right? And the way to induce regular people to connect computers to maintain those ledgers is to let them take a native token that has value on it, right? So that's why we have a decentralized ledger. It's not built for terrorism financing, it's built to allow us to have a truly decentralized internet. That is what it's all about. 
And so if you believe that American soft power in the world has a lot to do with the fact that we control ICANN and the internet protocol, I think you would feel similarly about the use of these internet protocols in, in financial services. DeFi is one example of that, where you know having open source software that's allocating credit versus having a credit officer sitting in an office. You know, these are ways of making sure that there's not some renegade employee who's discriminating or taking risks because the algorithm is visible for everybody to see and can be changed by other people on the network. To me, that's a more optimistic view of the future than a future that's on to the idea of individual bank credit officers, you know, allocating capital in our society. So you're talking here with some examples of promoting very forward thinking structures and policies rather than revisiting outdated regulations, which I don't think benefits consumers. But in order to maintain the supremacy of U.S. financial markets, we got to work on modernizing charters and finding ways to increase competition and innovation. Many finan modern financial services providers and fintech companies today face the choice of either relying on regulated partners or seeking existing charter options that limit technology development. You got other governments like Singapore, UK, the EU, and they provide a modernized regulatory options on top of traditional banking charters, which allows for more innovation. So what are some of the ways that, um, you know, that, that we can uh, navigate this system and, and promote innovation? Well, uh, that, that is a great question. One obvious example is to ask the question, why in the United States do we only allow banks, but not other financial systems uh, or, or companies to access the payment system? In the UK uh, and in other places that have open banking and e-money licenses, any payment company can access the payment rails. In the US, though, we fetishize and protect incumbent banks. That is a complete advantage. Thank you, and I yield back. Enjoy the time. Uh, thank you, Mr. Budd, and I would just remind everybody that uh, 10, 12 years ago, everybody was relying on uh, our Federal Reserve and our banking system to help kind of correct the global banking system. So, um, Mr. Torres, who is the newest member of our committee and uh, uh, was uh, looking forward to this uh, primer on uh, the banking system and currency, and I don't think he's been disappointed. I yield to the gentleman from New York for five minutes. Richie, you're muted. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's certainly a primer. I'm certainly new to these issues. Uh, obviously, one of the issues before us is the separation uh, of banking and commerce, you know, blurring the line between banking and commerce, as ILCs do, uh, raises concerns about systemic risk, moral hazard, and market concentration. My question is, have we seen any or all of these concerns borne out by the experience of other countries that allow for the intermingling of banking and commerce? What lessons can we learn from the experience of those countries? And anyone who knows the answer can feel free to answer, weigh in. I'm happy to speak to that issue, Congressman Torres. So I would say that um, a good example of the sort of thing, uh, the dangerous conglomeration that can occur when we have loopholes in the broader uh, depository infrastructure or allow things to exist like stable coins that act like deposits but are not regulated like deposits is, um, is to be found in China where the company Tencent has been brought further into the system but in a particular way that is not particularly good for users or the people of China, especially when it comes to privacy and surveillance. Of course, this is generally um, touted as bringing efficient, but intermingling in Tencent's case, a social media platform with banking has led to, again, an unprecedented amount of power that we have perhaps not seen in human history because of the way the data collection and surveillance works now. Wedding that further to our monetary infrastructure here does not bode well. Thanks. I could add to that, uh, Representative Torres, that uh, both in bank in Japan and in South Korea, there is an intermingling of banking and commerce. Um, the problem there in both of those countries is that that intermingling has served to entrench finan uh, financial and business conglomerates in both of those countries. So if we want our economies to have that high degree of concentration that we have in Korea and Japan, um, then we would start to uh, think about eroding the wall between commerce and, and banking. I just add to that, Representative Torres, if I may, that 
Um, we should also be really mindful, specifically not just about the theoretical issues here, um, but the practical prudential regulatory oversight that Professor Gerding raised earlier. Um, I also think it's imperative to think about who is participating in which actions. Um, this committee and the broader financial services committee and all of Congress, in fact, has been thoughtful about the implications of certain large technology firms and their continued consolidation and growth in the industry. I would like to underscore a point that uh, my colleague on the panel, Mr. Carrillo, pointed out, which is not solely a matter of um, the prudential regulation that we were talking about in the moment, the separation of, of commerce and banking, um, but also the specific consumer protection concerns that will impact citizens in every one of your districts without fail and, with, and without exclusion. Rural, urban, um, big city, small town, um, all across the nation, these companies uh, monetize, commodify data about citizens. And we're now thinking about giving them access to data regarding the financial transactions uh, of all citizens. And this is in a moment when we are unsure about what exact data protections exist for consumer financial data. This is an impending and continuing conversation and I don't want to take all of your time. I just want to underscore that consumer financial data protection uh, alongside the broader prudential regulatory issues, uh, I believe should be important to everyone without respect to partisanship. Now, now, I know that much of the regulation of these bank-like entities happens at the state level, but uh, a case could be made that as a general rule, it's much better to have uniformity in the law than to have a cacophony of widely varied state laws. So it seems sensible to have a, a federal framework for regulating fintech and cryptocurrencies and blockchain. Um, what's the argument against uh, uniformity in the law? I, I could address that if you'd like. Um, I, I think there is um, an interest in uniformity. And uh, Mr. Brooks mentioned money transmission stat, uh, statutes. It is difficult for payment systems or payment companies to comply with 50 different uh, payment statutes in different states. But the better way to do that is to have Congress act uh, to create or promote uniformity in statutes, not to have the OCC do that in a backdoor manner and basically preempt state laws with a four page policy document that created uh, a radical fintech uh, charter. Well, the district court agrees with you. Right? <laughs> Thank you. Gentlemen's time has expired. The gentleman from Minnesota, Mr. Emmer is now recognized for five minutes. Well, thank you, Chairman Perlmutter. I appreciate that. And Ranking Chairman uh, Luke DeMaio, I appreciate uh, that you're hosting what is a very important hearing in which we've been able to examine our unique dual banking system through a nonpartisan lens. As financial innovation advances, it's important that we work to provide appropriate and considerate regulatory avenues for fintech companies and financial institutions to best serve their customers. As we know, access to financial services greatly impacts the American consumer in terms of financial literacy, fair prices for financial services, and convenience. Competitive fintech companies that offer these affordable services to anyone with a cell phone should not be held back from deploying their services to any and every American, which is why I appreciate the testimony you heard today. In support of that, as policymakers, we must keep this focus at the forefront of our attention. It's my hope that the FinTech Task Force will be renewed for the 117th Congress, and I look forward to carrying out these policy issues further on that task force. Uh, with that, Mr. Brooks, it's great to see you again. Thank you for all your work over the past couple of years as the OCC, uh, as the Comptroller of the Currency. You demonstrated a strong commitment to drafting a regulatory environment or creating a regulatory environment that encourages innovation and growth in this fintech space. And you've been a leader in providing industry, the industry with the clarity uh, that's so necessary to make sure they can innovate confidently. Uh, question, Mr. Brooks, during your tenure at the OCC, the agency issued interpretive letters clarifying that national banks could offer services such as custody for digital assets that they historically offer for traditional assets, 
and that national banks could participate in independent node verification networks to facilitate payments. Why do you believe these issues require clarification and what impact do you believe these new technologies will have on the banking system? Well, Congressman Emmer, first of all, um, your, your uh, partnership and guidance on these issues uh, dating back long before I came to the OCC has been one of the joys of my life. I really appreciate all of the dialogue that we've had over the years about all these issues. Uh, I would answer it in, in two basic ways. Um, first of all, it became clear a year ago, a year and a half ago, that crypto assets had grown to a certain scale that bank customers, and, and I hope there's, there's some background noise, so maybe maybe we could mute our phones just so you can all hear me. Um, Somebody, uh, I think, Mr. Ever, maybe you need to mute. Great. So, so, so the point is, crypto is is now a two plus trillion dollar asset class, and the customers uh, who are owning crypto assets are the same people who are also depositors and checking account customers and mortgage borrowers, etc., of of banks. And so, it was no longer possible for us to ignore the fact that the assets that were growing in size and scale on the crypto side um, were lacking a safe place to be custodied or a safe place to be exchanged for value the way that all other assets can transact on a bank. So, so the first reason that we launched down the path was the recognition that the market had grown and that banks traditionally provide a safe custody location and safe transaction rails for, for people engaged in those things. But as we thought more deeply about that over time, what also became clear, and this comes back to my point about how we sort of tend to fetishize legacy banks over other people who are performing the same services in a different way, uh, is it became clear at a certain point that one of the things that blockchains are is their payment networks. They are a set of technologies for transmitting value from person A to person B. Now, as I said, in the United States, unlike in our global competitor countries, we only allow banks as defined to connect to the government payment system at the Federal Reserve or to connect to the automated clearinghouse, which is essentially the bank cartel that runs its own payment system. We don't allow other companies. And at the OCC, our basic view was, well, wait a minute, there's nothing magic about Fedwire, there's nothing magic about ACH. The point is, banks have a statutory power to process payments. That's the paying checks power in 12 USC section 24. And so if a new technology has arisen, which is an open blockchain platform for transmitting payments, there's no reason banks shouldn't be allowed to take advantage of the faster, more secure, and more certain environment of blockchain if they can also connect to Fedwire or SWIFT or ACH. That's the point of what innovation is always about. And by the way, the OCC has always used interpretive letters to clarify the way that existing bank powers can be conducted on new technology platforms. Think back to the 1960s when the controller at the time issued an interpretive letter that said banks can engage in data processing. No one thought Congress had to act at that time, but the point is computers had been invented, and now a new internet of finance called blockchain has been invented, and the OCC will always lead and help banks with technology. Thank you. My time's expired. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Emmer. Uh, the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Garcia, is uh, recognized for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Chairman uh, Perlmutter and Ranking Member Lukemeyer for convening this hearing. And uh, thanks to all of our witnesses today for shedding light on a complicated but important uh, topic. Uh, I represent a working class immigrant, a largely immigrant district, and my district uh, in Illinois it needs the same things as any other district. We need investment in our neighborhoods and institutions. We need opportunities for growth. And all too often, these things are out of reach for communities like mine. Unfortunately, that's not new, but every time a company wants to get out of regulations, they say that they're gonna change that. They say that they're going to help if they can just sell a certain type of product or market in a certain way, that's not new either. What I'm worried about is that uh, the business model of many companies we're discussing today is either take advantage of consumers or take advantage of unregulated competitors, um, of regulated competitors, I should say. Since my colleagues mentioned the true lender rule, I want to clarify that I introduced a resolution to repeal the rule for that very reason. The rule undermines the ability of states like mine and more than a dozen others to protect consumers from predatory lending, but I turned back. Uh, Mr. Girding, uh, let's say a retail company like Walmart or Amazon offered financial services through an ILC. All of a sudden, they know a lot about you. 
They know how much money you have or whether you can pay your credit card bill. They know what you buy. So should consumers worry about this kind of uh, uh, blending of commercial and financial companies? And would these companies have a competitive advantage over other businesses that don't have this kind of data about their customers? Uh, absolutely. Um... Uh, Representative Garcia, they should be worried. Um, one of the things that the other panelists have mentioned earlier is that you are you have to worry not only about financial stability, but data privacy. And a lot of the big tech and big retail companies already have enormous amounts of information about consumers. Being able to combine that with payment services, banking services, and information, financial information about customers would exacerbate those problems. I should note that there is one way of dealing with that. The Graham Leach Bliley Act, one of the bright spots of that act was introducing privacy regulation. But that privacy rules under Graham Leach Bliley only apply to financial institutions. So if um, large conglomerates are going to be entering into the banking space and being given bank charters. I think we need to start thinking about expanding and applying the Graham Leach Bliley privacy provisions to a whole host of larger institutions and larger conglomerates. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Carrillo, in your testimony, you discussed how companies and laws that claim to expand financial access for underserved communities can end up preying on those communities. Can you tell us about the risks of allowing new fintech companies to offer unregulated services? And how can Congress promote economic inclusion without leaving our constituents vulnerable to exploitation? Thank you very much, uh, Representative Garcia. Um, I want to zoom out and say that, um, to your point, the in this war between the neo-Hamiltonians and the neo-Jeffersonians, who's lost is the actual people who currently use the U.S. financial system. And people do not need to be included if they're included in a predatory structure. They do not need to be given access to credit if what they're given access to is something that actually hurts. The way that, for instance, the former acting controller talks about credit you would think that it had no downside. And he still has not addressed the privacy issues, nor have any of the Republican members of this panel, despite the fact that they go to our very constitutional protections, which should be important to everyone in this room. I would appreciate if we did not look at this debate with one eye. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chair, you back. May I just add one tiny um, line to what Professor Girding just offered regarding privacy protections in the Graham Leach Bliley Act? The Dodd Frank Act also contains in Section 1033 um, an opportunity area for this Congress to act and to protect consumer financial data. Um, I, I really think that your commentary is accurate. The marginalized, hardworking, um, low income, no income, uh, struggling middle class families um, in many of these, the districts represented by this committee would be most vulnerable um, if some of the conglomerates existing in big tech gain access to additional information. In fact, they will form surveillance capitalism and that will most affect black and brown individuals, just to be blunt and honest. Thank you for chiming in, Professor Johnson. Thank you. I yield back to the chair. Thank you, Mr. Garcia. I think that is the last uh, member to uh, be here and to want to ask questions. Uh, I think we've gone on two and a half hours now, so I will uh, want to bring this to a close. This has been very interesting and to the ranking member's point, I think we're just really beginning to get some idea of this subject and the, the need for innovation, as Mr. Brooks has talked about, so that, you know, uh, people use the services and, you know, don't skirt businesses don't skirt around the edges of the system where there's no regulation whatsoever, but also the detriments, whether it's privacy or some kind of uh, abusive approaches that, uh, that a company may take to, you know, to an individual or to a business. We've got, there's nothing new under the sun. It might happen faster or something might happen in a different way, uh, but we need to make sure that we, um, have prudential regulations that allow for business and individuals to transact things and uh, but without being harmed. And so I think, uh, Mr. Ranking Member, I'm going to try to convince the committee that we have another 
couple uh, hearings on this subject. And so um, I'd like to thank our panelists, your, your testimony, both your oral testimony, your written testimony, outstanding. I wish Mr. Torres would here be, was here because if you read all of those papers that you've all written, uh, you learn just about everything there is about the banking system from uh, Hamilton and Jefferson uh, to today. So without objection, I'd like to enter statements into the records of uh, the American Bankers Association, the American Financial Services Association, the Bank Policy Institute, the Consumer Bankers Association, Independent Community Bankers of America, National Association of Industrial Bankers, uh, I was surprised nobody mentioned Glass-Steagall uh, in the commerce and banking kind of context today. Um, but obviously, uh, as we came through the Depression, we wanted to make sure that we didn't mix commerce and banking. I want to thank all the witnesses for their testimony and for devoting their time, their talent, their intelligence uh, to share your expertise with this subcommittee. Your testimony today will help advance the work of our subcommittee and U.S. House of Representatives. The chair notes some members uh, may have additional questions for this panel, uh, which they can submit to you in writing and without objection. The hearing record will remain open for five legislative days for members submit, to submit written questions to these witnesses and to place their responses in the record. And also without objection, members will have five legislative days to submit extraneous materials to the chair for inclusion in the record. I remind members to submit written questions and materials for the record to the email address provided. Uh, thank you all very much for your testimony. Uh, to the Coloradans, uh, good to have you here, but to those of you not from Colorado, we're very happy that you participated as well. And with that, uh, this hearing is adjourned. <laughs>